Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, Karen gave my phone number to a strange guy who I want nothing to do with. I, 35 female, am a single mother to two kids who are five and three. Both my kids are in daycare, and over the years, I've built a solid friend group with a handful of other moms, and our kids regularly get together for playdates. The father of my kids is not in the picture at all, and my relationship with him is non-existent. This is 100% for the best, and I'm currently in therapy to deal with a lot of things that he put me through. This friend group has literally been a lifesaver for me at times. A few months ago, there were two new kids that started at our daycare center. They're similar in age to my kids and were placed in the same classes as them. I noticed that their dad was the only parent to ever pick up or drop off the kids. He would try to make small talk with me a few times, but I'm uncomfortable around strange men, so I would be polite but not engage further than that. Our mom group has a group chat that we use to support each other and arrange playdates. A few weeks ago, one of the moms texted the group chat that she was adding this new dad to our group chat because he wanted to have his kids participate in playdates outside of daycare. I privately texted that other mom and I told her I don't feel comfortable with a man I don't even know having my contact information and I told her that she should have consulted all of us before deciding on her own to add him to our group chat. I then texted the rest of the moms and told them that I want them to keep a separate group chat without the other dad because I don't know him and it makes me uncomfortable. This resulted in a lot of divided opinions with about half of the moms agreeing to a separate chat and the other half saying that would be too difficult to keep track of and that it's wrong to exclude another parent just because he's a man and that I'm being unreasonable. The mom I texted privately replied to me that she has talked with this dad numerous times and that he seems like a nice person and a good parent and that his kids shouldn't be excluded if they want to hang out with their friends outside of daycare. She told me I'm being difficult and making this all harder than it needs to be. The other day when I picked up my kids, my five-year-old was upset because a bunch of his friends were talking about a play date that he wasn't invited to. I texted the moms about it and they said that they were getting the kids together with the new dad and didn't invite my kids because of how I was acting. I told them it was rude to exclude my kids like that and a couple of the moms told me to grow up because that's exactly what I was trying to do to this dad and his kids. I'm at a loss because these moms have been so supportive to me in the past and as soon as this dad comes into the picture, it's like they pulled a 180 and don't seem to care at all. There are still other moms who agree with me, but now it's like our friend group has been divided by this. You aren't the bad guy for not wanting your personal contact information shared with a person you don't know, regardless of their gender, or for not wanting to participate in activities where people you don't know are present. This is a boundary that you're welcome to set but you do not get to dictate what the other moms in the group do. Those who criticized you for setting this boundary were wrong, but it sounds like they ultimately respected it by not inviting you to an event where the dad would be present. The only person you can dictate gets to be in this friend group is yourself. Trying to exclude anyone else for any reason, when it's not a group consensus, makes you the jerk here. Set your boundaries and enforce them, but remember, boundaries do not force a behavior or action on others. It's about what you will accept. I will not be participating in activities or group chats where men I don't know are present is perfectly acceptable and enforceable. I don't want men I don't know in our group chat or at group activities is not a boundary, it's trying to control the group. Don't get upset when people respect your boundaries because what you really wanted was for them to pick you over someone else. You're the jerk. You're the jerk. You called him a strange man when you have barely had a conversation with him and have not pointed out anything to warrant him as strange, which makes it seem like you just have an issue when a man is the sole guardian of his kids. And the other moms are correct. You're being hypocritical to want to exclude him and his kids from conversations and playdates, but then you get upset when the same happens to you. What if he's a widow? What if his ex is bad like yours and he's trying to recover with his kids like yourself? Could you imagine if you and your kids were excluded from the group because you did not fit the normal family type? Not married to the father of your kids? Would that make you feel bad? Now imagine how he feels, being excluded just because he's a man and is present in his kids' lives. Do better, OP. If you don't, it will most likely be your kids that end up being excluded. You're the jerk. No wonder your baby daddy isn't in the picture. You sound absolutely unbearable, and your kids are really going to have a lot of problems because of your bitterness and hostility. I came home, and my wife is gone. I have a great ability to hide my cheating, but also haven't seemed to need it because my wife works all the time and we do have a great love life, 
so I would be shocked if she even suspected I was doing what I was doing. That's why I'm going crazy right now. I come home from work yesterday and usually my wife gets home about 30 minutes after I do. When I realized it's getting late, I called and got no answer. I check our room and her things are gone. She left the house completely untouched, took all of her clothes, but left no note. I can't get in touch with her through phone, email, her friends won't answer. She must know, right? Which, why wouldn't she ask me? Who finds out and just leaves? Is it possible she doesn't know and left for someone else? Let her go. You're done for. She will contact you with your next instructions. Likely will be served soon. OP. Didn't she technically abandon the home? How can she serve me? Update. Nine hours later. She's a sociopath. She's known for months. She hooked up with me and smiled in my face for months. I now know that she knows. She has known for months. She's been more deceitful about knowing than I have about doing it. And maybe that's why I'm so angry. I can't even have interest in my affair partner now. This is not what I want. How do I not go through this? I wouldn't have done it if I thought she'd find out. Sorry, I'm just desperate. I definitely need to fix it because I need to know how she even found out. Okay, what did you think would happen if and when she found out? Were you disappointed that she didn't scream and cry and play the pick me game? She found out and decided it was a deal breaker on her end. You got off easy. No arguing, screaming and crying. No therapy or malicious compliance to sit through and pay for. Probably took those months to stash some cash, find a place or another guy. Don't think there's any way to fix this. OP. Maybe a little. I don't know why I felt this way. But yeah, I guess I wanted to see some kind of reaction. I know it doesn't make sense, but it's just how I feel. She makes most of the money, so that's another thing that sucks. I'll basically have to ask her for some kind of support to keep living the kind of lifestyle we've been living. I wish she would fight me. Seems like she's willing to let everything go, including her own money, just to avoid me. It's making me feel like I don't even know her. Update the next day. I just found out what happened now from her mom. One of my wife's interns works a second job at the hotel where a fair partner and I met three towns away, but my wife had a picture of us on her phone screen so she recognized me. After that, I guess she called my wife the next time we were there and my wife stopped in to confirm, then left. What's getting to me is that this was in March. I never saw any changes in her. Update. I finally talked to my wife this afternoon. I've been in our house since Thursday night by myself, pretty much clueless as to what was going on until her mother, who she has very little contact with, reached out to me. I was caught. I've been caught since March. Wife texted me today saying she had intended to contact me through a lawyer and just let the divorce do the talking. But since her mother decided to contact me, she would answer any questions I had if I had a desire to speak to her. Clearly I did. I asked her why she stayed around after she knew and how she just lied to me like that. She said it wasn't her intention, but she shut down to figure out what she needed to do regarding our relationship and herself. At the end, she said something like, she realized she still loves me, but doesn't respect me. And she said she thinks that I love her, but don't respect her either. So we should go our separate ways. She already got her job to move her to the city she's been asking me to move to for a long time now. And said she'd like to sell me half of the house if I want it. And if not, we can list it. But I guess our lawyers will handle that paperwork. And I still have no idea if I want our house without her in it. I'm glad I talked to her, but I'm sad at how moved on she is. She did cry a little bit but then stopped. I asked for therapy and she said I should have asked for that when I realized I had impulse control issues. I've been drinking for 48 hours now and I'm sorry for the rant. I don't think it's losing her that's hurting me, but losing like this. Well, that was a wild read. The mental jujitsu this guy has to do to make her the bad guy would be exhausting to anyone with a normally developed sense of morality. Can't get over him thinking her exit was just as deceitful as his cheating. But, but babe, why are you divorcing me months after you found out I was cheating? What about my feelings? How could you do this to me? Hey Reddit boy, why do people make such stupid decisions? You thought that was bad? How about this one? Today I messed up by spending $90,000 on a Dodge Charger. Last year at the ripe age of 24 and suddenly flush with cash, I thought it would be a genius move to buy a Dodge Charger Hellcat. Not just any Charger though. I paid a whopping $90,000 for it, way above the sticker price, right when the car market was at its 2022 peak thanks to lockdown pricing bubble. 
Talk about timing, right? It was great for about two weeks, but then I realized that this thing was eating me alive. The insurance, $800 a month. Gas, $600, plus $20 every time I floored it. That was more than my rent. Cut to last month, I'm driving home from work, I take a corner too fast, and boom, I've managed to total this beast. Went to my insurance, and they're only willing to cough up $55,000 for it, thanks to the muscle car market taking a nosedive. There I was, thinking I had made a smart investment, only to end up with a negative $35,000 facepalm moment. Everyone had warned me. The market's inflated, they said. You're paying way too much, they warned. Did I listen? Nope. I was too caught up in the dream of roaring down the streets in that V8 supercharged monster. The crash itself was like a slapback to reality. Beyond the twisted metal and lost dreams, it hit me how massive a financial blunder I had made. That $35,000 gap wasn't just about the money. It was a lesson in humility and the value of financial wisdom, or my lack of it. This mistake wasn't just about wrecking a car. It was about wrecking my financial stability over a moment of impulsive pride. If there's any silver lining here, it's the hard-earned wisdom that comes from learning the hard way. To anyone reading this, let my mistake be your lesson. In the world of big purchases, especially in a volatile market, don't let your impulses take the wheel. Just breathe and relax. And for the love of all that's financially sane, if you ever find yourself suddenly rich and eyeing a high-performance car, maybe just don't. Or at least think twice. Do your research and for goodness sake, wait out the market frenzy. My wife and I are having problems over one of her friends that she goes skiing with. Plus update. Background. My wife is an avid skier. She tries to ski every chance she gets, and that's often multiple times a week. I'm very supportive of this, as it seems like a good way for her to relieve herself of stress, and it generally makes her happier. She's made multiple close friendships through this hobby, male and female, and some weekends they take ski trips to resorts out of town. I ski sometimes, but I'm not an enthusiast, and this group wants to tackle a lot of challenging runs that I'm not capable of at my current skill level. Also in the off-season, they do other activities to maintain their fitness. None of this has ever been a problem until recently. A few months ago, my wife went trail running with a guy named Josh that was new to the group. I didn't know she was going alone until after she came back. I found that a little unusual since she usually goes with a couple of her girlfriends and maybe one other guy. Also, she had never really done this activity before. The next thing that happened that I thought was unusual was when she got sick during lockdown, so she was isolating from me. She wanted to watch a movie on Amazon Prime and I told her to bring me her laptop so I could take care of the two-factor authentication stuff. While I was using her laptop, she seemed cagey and agitated and was hovering a little too close to me considering we were supposed to be isolating. At this time, I noticed she was looking at a love horoscope for her sign and Josh and one of those recently closed tabs. This didn't sit right with me and I was stewing about it. My wife noticed and she asked why I was upset and I confronted her. She told me the horoscope thing was just a curiosity and she looks it up for other people as well. I find this hard to believe. She offered me her phone to look through her messages and I went through them. There were a lot of messages for a text chain that started only a couple of months ago. Probably more than we exchanged in the same period. Mostly her sending him memes and friendly back and forth. To me it seemed excessive and it looked like she was going out of her way to keep a conversation going with Josh. There was also a provocative exchange she made that went something like this. Josh, I would do bad things for some lasagna. Wife, oh, like what? Josh, I don't know, steal it? Wife, that's not what I was thinking. That's what I get when my mind is in the gutter. Josh, laughing emoji. To me, this looks like an unsuccessful attempt by her to escalate the conversation, but Josh, to his credit, doesn't bite. When I saw this, I pointed it out and she took blame for it and said she shouldn't have sent that. I'm shaking and very upset by all of this. My wife claims he's just one of the girls and she isn't attracted to him because he's short and he's just a good friend. All of this reminded me of an emotional affair situation that I went through with my wife 10 years ago. We've been married for 20. We got through that and I was hoping that was behind us. In response to this, I set up two boundaries. One, no more one-on-one -on -one events with Josh. Two, avoid the one-on-one -on -one texting. There's not usually a reason to text one-on-one -on -one when the same type of content can be shared in a group text. The next week, she said two of her girlfriends canceled on an event and she asked if it was okay if she went alone with Josh. 
I told her obviously not because that was a boundary I set and she was annoyed with me for saying no. She met with her therapist and her therapist largely agreed with my point of view and she seemed to be less annoyed with me after that. I've been off and on depressed about all of this and during that she would ask me if there was anything she could do and I just asked her to follow the boundaries I've set. Cut to last week, I asked her to check in on the boundaries I set. She admitted to texting with Josh again and I asked to see her phone. There was a gap in the texting, but there was six or seven consecutive days again with a lot of texting. Again, it's just benign texting, but it just seems kind of unnecessary. I don't know that we need three days around Christmas to text Merry Christmas and start a conversation. I don't think you need to tell your single guy friend goodnight in the evening. She says she was just giving him a resource for some technical safety gear and she started doing it again. I'm very upset about it and I tell her that she was ignoring a clearly set boundary and I'm not sure how we can get past this as a couple. I find it really disrespectful and hurtful that she ignore this boundary, especially when she saw what it was doing to me. I found it very cruel. I talked to her about blocking contacts with this person and ending the friendship so that we could move on. Considering that she already violated a clearly set boundary, I felt the need to escalate. She seemed open to that initially, but was indignant about it later on. I've asked her to apologize for ignoring the boundary and disrespecting me in the marriage, promise she won't do it again, and outline some steps to ensure it won't happen again. She seems to think I'm setting up an ultimatum on friendship, but I just want a path forward I can be comfortable with. She says she wasn't doing this to be cruel. She doesn't seem all that sorry to me. She says she has a deep connection with Josh. <laughs> I bet she does. But again, they're just friends. She doesn't want to end the friendship because she says she will be outside the core group of enthusiasts and the activities that they set up. My position is that my wife is acting inappropriately and disregarding my feelings by ignoring the boundary. I believe my wife loves me, but I also think she has a crush on this guy and is kind of acting on it and downplaying it. Am I overreacting? Am I being unreasonable? What should I do? Update. The funny part before the rest. I had read her the original post to show her how it looked to everyone. Her palms started to get so sweaty it left a stain on the laptop. She didn't have a lot to say about it except, wow, this is a lot to process. We set up a counseling appointment to work on things. The working solution we had was that she would tell me when they texted each other. My wife was following through with that and I thanked her every time. I also told her if she slipped up in some way to just acknowledge it, not delete messages and whatnot. The counseling session was lame. The counselor seemed like he was on autopilot and just wanted to get to the Gottman books. We set up a couple of future appointments. She had a work trip coming up. We went skiing the day before and I took her to the airport and kissed her goodbye. I texted her from time to time and she would send pictures of the things she was seeing but seemed a little unresponsive. I figured she was just busy with everything going on. She never called me or our daughter. She would say she was taking a bath at the end of the night. I picked her up from the airport and brought her home and she seemed distant. I had to ask for a hug. She went skiing the next day. Things felt weird and I checked the phone bill and lo and behold, she called Josh for an hour one night, then he called her two other nights for a couple of hours. I checked her Facebook. The messages from her friends were talking about how he tried to kiss her at some point, but they hadn't cut him out of the group in any way. Also, one of her friends told her to delete messages and call logs before coming home as I might check them. These are all garbage people. I put her stuff in garbage bags and told her off when she got home. I told her she was such a cheater and the guy was a cheater and they deserved each other. She didn't have much to say because she couldn't even come up with a bad lie. Filled her car up and left. I'm astounded at how morally bankrupt she is and her friends are as well. I've met these people. They know who I am and that I'm a decent guy. I just can't imagine encouraging someone to hide immoral behavior. I asked her from the start of this mess if she wanted to exit the relationship and she said she wanted to work things out. She saw how much pain it was causing me and she kept doing it. You think you know people. I believe she was playing me and the guy off of each other, hinting to him that our relationship wasn't solid and maybe someday they could be a couple, while also trying to reconcile with me. She's a narcissist and this was feeding her ego. The short term sucks because I'm stressed and it's hurting my ability to sleep. Sorry if some of this doesn't make sense. I know I'll be better on the long run, but this sucks right now. It's pretty lame that she gets to shack up with this dirt bag and I probably won't feel like dating for years. Anyway, once a cheater, always a cheater. Trust your gut. I should have told her to buzz off a long time ago. Hope I don't get destroyed in the divorce. My girlfriend lied about our vacation and I am beyond angry. So for context, 
My girlfriend and I have been together for a very long time. Everything's perfect. However, lately she and I haven't been able to see each other as often as we would like. She's busy with finishing school, and I myself have been very busy with work. So we planned a vacation together as soon as we finally had time for one another. We planned a vacation to a country we both have never been to and where an old friend of hers lives. Let's refer to her as B. B is someone who I personally despise. She's a textbook narcissist as well as having cheated on her boyfriend multiple times, who for the record is a pretty stand-up guy. As soon as we were planning the vacation, it became apparent that we were going to pay this friend of hers a visit, seeing as we're there anyway, as well as the fact that B's birthday is sometime during our vacation. I of course thought little of it. We'll pay her a visit for her birthday, eat some cake, and break open a bottle of wine. You know, the usual. My girlfriend knows that I despise B, but she also knows that I can play nice. I mean, it's just a day, or so I thought. A couple of weeks before our departure, she informed me that two other friends of hers, let's call them C and D, were also going to this same country during the same time as our trip. Once again, I thought little of it. Maybe they heard we were going, and seeing as the trip is quite cheap, perhaps they wanted to go as well. Then I was told that they were on the same flight as us. Fine, I thought. I can deal with it. We'll have to travel with them for a little while, but after that, it's finally just me and my girlfriend getting the quality time we deserve. Then, just days prior, I found out that C and D are in the same hotel as us. In fact, they were in the exact opposite room of ours. Strange, I thought, but perhaps another coincidence. Our hotel is quite cheap, so maybe they happen to book the same one as us, and the room was just a coincidence. Two days ago, we finally arrived, and that's when I finally learned the truth of this vacation. She had made plans with her friends on every single day. There was no time and opportunity for me to be alone with my partner. In fact, B also was going to be with us every day. In fact, she was the one who made most of the plans for our group, which I never even agreed to. And of course, B chose all kinds of things which I despise. B despises me as much as I despise her, seeing as I was the one who exposed her cheating to her boyfriend a long time ago. Now my girlfriend expects me to do everything she and her friends are going to do, which I don't want to. I wanted to have a nice calm vacation with my partner after months of us not being together. It honestly feels like she has no respect for me anymore. I talked to her about it and she just said she doesn't know what else to do and she doesn't want to disappoint her friends. Honestly, I'm at a loss here. I'm considering just booking a solo ticket back without telling my girlfriend and just leaving as soon as possible. It feels like I'm not even supposed to be here. I'm the fifth wheel with people I don't even like, especially not B. I'm just beyond angry. She doesn't want to disappoint her friends? But that you're disappointed doesn't count? Why are her friends more important than you are? Man, I would bounce, especially if she already knew you hated her friend. She doesn't seem to care or want to spend time with you. Sorry, man. My condolences on your newfound unplanned singleness. If your girlfriend considers a cheating narcissist as a good friend, it says bad things about her, on top of the fact that this whole thing shows that she prioritizes time with her friends over time with you. Karen demands benefits and insurance. I work on an IT help desk that's phone number is one off from a military benefits help desk number. We tend to get the other help desk's calls several times a week, which makes it often enough to include in the initial training for new employees. Normally, the person on the other end has misdialed. We provide the right phone number and we go our separate ways amicably. On one particular occasion, Sergeant Karen called and would not believe me that she had dialed the wrong number. While I appreciate that she was trying to get her family the benefits her military service more than deserved, I could not help her to get them. We've got Sergeant Karen and we've got me. We've got awesome supervisor. Phone rings. Me. Thank you for calling my help desk. This is OP. How may I help you? Sergeant Karen. This is Sergeant Karen. I need to get this string of benefits, insurance, etc. for myself and my family. Me. I'm sorry. You've called the incorrect help desk for that. Let me get the number for the other help. No. This is the number for my help desk and you will help me now. I have kids and they need to be covered on my insurance. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am, but this is not your help desk. This help desk is for reporting IT issues from employees of my organization. Our number is one off from that one. It is possible you misdialed. It happens all the time. I did not misdial. I know I called the right number. This is the number I have, and you will help me now. Me. Ma'am. 
I am telling you, this is not your help desk. If I could help, I would, but I do not work there and have no way of accessing their systems. Let me speak to your supervisor. Yes, ma'am. Transfer the call to awesome supervisor who sits in the next cubicle over. Supervisor. This is the help desk. Supervisor here. How may I? No, ma'am. This is not the other help desk. Well, be that way then, jerk. Sergeant Karen had hung up abruptly when my supervisor confirmed that this was indeed not the number for the other help desk. Next we've got, we close in just a few minutes and you want what? So this just happened moments ago and now that I'm home, I can tell the tale. My store closes at 10 p.m. Sometime within the last 15 to 20 minutes before we shut those doors for the night, I noticed an order in our photo lab that had just come through to be processed Went back, printed the labels, read what they were, started the order, and left. Over the span of not even two minutes, more orders came through, making a total of six orders for one person. People forget things to add last minute and don't want to lose progress in making something online. It's understandable. Thirteen posters, two canvases, and a handful of 8x10 prints. Wouldn't be done tonight, but it is normal to receive large orders. A few minutes later, the phones are ringing from an incoming call. Me. Thank you for calling the store. My name's OP. How can I help you this evening? Customer. Hi. I just placed an order a few minutes ago and was wondering when they would be ready. Me. Alrighty. What's your last name so I can check the status? Customer's name. Proceed to check the bins with completed orders, then looking at the computer screen, her name was the big order. Me. You had the posters, canvases, and the 8x10s, correct? Yes. Four posters have been printed, and the 8x10s are still printing. Canvases are not able to start until the posters finish. Your order should be complete before 8 tomorrow morning. Customer. But I need them first thing tomorrow. Can I pick them up tonight? Cue me checking the time real quick before answering her question. Ni. Nee. I'm sorry, ma'am, but we will be closing in 7 minutes. Our staff in the morning can put together your canvases, and the rest of the order can print throughout the night. We open at 7 a.m. if you wanted to ask for a more accurate time frame. Customer, angrily. Your website says one hour. How long does it take for you to do your job? Me, tired but trying to keep up the cheerful voice. Normally it is one hour, yes, but our machines can only go so fast, ma'am. The posters and the canvas products print from the same machine and the printing time can vary depending on the size of just one image. It can vary anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes to print one thing and that's if there isn't a mechanical malfunction that can make the image streak or if ink needs to be changed, then it might need to be reprinted. It takes almost half an hour to put together a canvas while making sure it's crisp and correctly done. We now close in 5 minutes. The pickup time on your order automatically says that they should be ready between 9.45am and 10.05am. 8 is the earliest we can get these ready for you. Now, end that with a dial tone, cause she just hung up on me. If it was someone who needed pictures for court, a classroom, anything else, so long as they were in the store before closing and it wasn't going to take long at all, both the manager and I would have stayed to help and get it ready. We've done it in the past. There's no way that would have been done before 11.30. Who's to say she would even show up? Sometimes, people say they need stuff immediately and never walk into the store or come back until days later. Would you have stayed and completed the order or just told her to come back tomorrow? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got just another customer who refuses to take no for an answer. I had the pleasure of fielding a phone call from a customer who refused to understand that what he was asking for simply wasn't possible. Customer. Hi, I was in your store yesterday and saw this hat I liked, but you didn't have it in black. I was wondering if you could order it into the store so I could buy it. Me. Let me check our inventory system right now. If we have it in one of our distribution centers or another store, we could absolutely place an order for you and have you pick it up at our store. I checked and we didn't carry the hat in black at all. To be clear, it wasn't that it was sold out or currently unavailable or anything like that. We just didn't carry that product in black. Never had and had no plans to do so. Me. Hi there. I just checked and it looks like we don't carry that style in black. So, unfortunately, I can't order it into the store for you. Him. Really? But black is such a popular color. Why don't you have it in black? Me. I agree, it is a very popular color, but we just don't sell that style in black at all. 
Very sorry about that. Him. But the company that makes the hat sells it in black on their website. Me. I understand. We don't sell that hat in black. But if you want to, you could buy it from that company directly. Him. Your store had a better price for it. I'd really prefer to buy it from you if you could order it in. So not only does he want us to order this item in for him and him alone, he also wants us to sell it to him at a discounted price. Me. Right. The thing is, if we as a store were out of stock, but we carried it as a chain, I could order it in for you. But since we don't carry it at all, I have no way to order it for you. Him. You couldn't just order one in for me? I'm a loyal customer. I bought something the last time I was in. Me. Unfortunately, we just don't have that style in black in our system at all. There's no way to order it in, and in terms of distribution, we can't place orders for just one item. Here's where I started getting really frustrated with his refusal to accept that what he was asking for just wasn't possible. Him. Well, what if you order a few in? Me. I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. I don't control our distribution or what products we stock. Him. Well then, can I speak to your manager? I'm sure he'd be happy to order in a product for a loyal customer. At this point, I'm happy to have an out from this conversation, even if it means potentially annoying my manager with a frivolous phone call. Me. Sure thing. I'll put your call through to him. It'll just be a moment. Him. Actually, can you put me on hold and lay some groundwork with your manager? Let him know I'm a loyal customer. I just bought something recently. I really want to buy this hat through you. And then, when you have him on my side, then can you put the call through? Me. I'm going to connect you to my manager now. What I didn't tell him was this. I'm definitely going to lay some groundwork with my manager in terms of apologizing for sending him this call and letting him know how persistent and annoying you've been up until now. My manager took the call, came up a few minutes later and just said, don't worry about it. He understands he's not getting the hat through us. If I had to do over, I would have been more brief and just let him know it wasn't possible and then hung up on him. It's still crazy just how far people will push it to get things exactly how they want them. If you were handling a customer like this, what exactly would you tell them? Please let me know in the comments. Next we've got Entitled Dad Takes My 3000 Euro Guitar March 2019 I used to play guitar for many years. I started when I was about 6 or 7 and had to quit after my third year of university since Italian law school is extremely hard. Now that I finally graduated, I decided to start playing again. When I quit, I sold or gave away many of my guitars, keeping just my first one as a memory of my granddad, who I lost two years ago. So, first things first, I looked for a good instrument. Since I couldn't find one, I wanted an 8-string guitar, since I usually play really heavy stuff. I ended up with a luthier custom-made beast. Since I also found a really well-paying job, I decided to treat myself, as I never had good instruments and this is the very first one I've ever bought that cost more than $200 or $300. It was a dream come true. Fast forward a bit. January 2020. I was at this shop, which is also renowned for being really good with setups, and of course, I brought my guitar with me so that they could take a closer look and inspect it. I was at the shop's counter for maybe over an hour, since most of the employees are my friends, and we started talking about stuff like how we were doing news, albums, etc. Also, it took them some time to give me an answer about my setup, since I had really specific requests. Introduce Poor Kid and Entitled Dad While the kid started looking around with his eyes shining, his dad immediately started complaining about, Where the heck is everyone here? I have a job, and I can't waste my time like this. I was minding my own business on my phone when I felt someone tapping at my back. It was Poor Kid. Excuse me, sir. Can I look at your guitar? I put away my phone and said, of course, and took a step back. He was amazed and started asking questions about it. Like, why does it have eight strings? What do I play? What's my favorite band, etc. He then thanks me and gets back to the guitars he was looking at. As the kid goes away, his father comes to me with an annoyed face. Hey there, that's a nice guitar you have. Thanks, sir. So is your son buying his first one? His son was probably about 10. Yeah, but these ones cost too much, and I saw he liked yours. How much did you pay for it? Well, I won't be suggesting you to buy an instrument like this as his first one. This guitar is a custom handmade one. It was pretty expensive. 
Like 400 euro? No. Actually, I paid a bit more like 3,000 euro. Don't lie. There is no way a piece of wood can cost that much money. I'll give you 90 for it. I'm sorry. What? You heard me. I said 90 euro for your guitar. I was shocked. I never had to face an entitled dad before, and I was literally speechless. Okay, I'll give you 100 euro, but nothing more than that. Sorry, but it's not for sale. And even if it was, I could never sell it for, what, 1 30th of its price? Now you're just being mean. It's for my kid. Can't you do something nice and sell it to him? No, this is my first good guitar, and there are literally hundreds of them here. I'm sure you can find something he likes that you can afford. But he likes yours. And as he said that, he started trying to reach for it. I blocked his arm without hurting him. My guitar has a really thin neck, and it can be damaged or even snapped if handled carelessly. What are you doing? Come on, be a grown man. If you bought it once, you can buy it another time. Absolutely no. Please, sir, stop harassing me or I'll call the owners. He burst into a laugh before starting screaming how I was supposed to give it to him, that he knew the owner of the shop, who was one of his closest friends, and that he would call the police because I assaulted him when I grabbed his arm. The poor kid came close to us, looking deluded at his father, saying that he was embarrassing him and stopped doing what he was trying to do, and that he always did that. The entitled dad looked at his son with anger and yelled to him, Go away and look at those stupid guitars. By that time, the cashier and the owner were back, since they probably heard the commotion. Is there something wrong here? As I was saying no, the entitled father started ranting about me being mean to both him and his son, that I had assaulted him and that now he demanded me give him my instrument. Otherwise, he would have to call the cops on both me and the owner. I was so confused that I couldn't even understand how furious I was at that point. The owner looked at him, and when Entitled Dad finally finished with his nonsense, turned to me. Was he really trying to take your instrument, OP? Well, yes, but I stopped him because I was worried he would have taken it from the neck damaging it. Sir, we have cameras everywhere. I know OP, and he would never do such things. I ask you and your son to leave, or we'll have to call the police. You can't do that. I was assaulted. The owner clearly had enough of that, so he took out his phone and started dialing for help. The dad went to grab his kid and stormed out of the shop, yelling how incompetent the owner was, how I had been a horrible person, and many other funny things I can't report. I felt bad for his son though. He was really kind, and I saw how he would have liked a brand new guitar to start playing, so I run after them, and ignoring the father, I asked the kid if he wanted an instrument. He was crying, but as I asked him that, he gave me a smile as bright as the sun. He went back, spent a good hour while his dad was waiting by the entrance, trying different guitars, and he ended up choosing a Fender all-in-one pack, since he would have needed an amp as well. I understood that his father was not going to be able to afford it, and I decided to buy it for him myself. He was the happiest kid I've ever seen. He and his dad got out of the shop, and I was finally able to get all the details about the work I wanted to be done on my rig, paid my deposit, and of course, bought some picks. When I finally got out from the shop 10 minutes later, I noticed that the dad was waiting outside. His eyes were red and he started apologizing for his behavior. He explained to me how he used to work for a construction company, but he eventually got fired as the company declared bankruptcy. My granddad runs his own construction company, so I knew the one he was talking about. Pretty nasty stuff. Manager caught stealing profits, unpaid shifts and work days, forced closure, no liquidation whatsoever. Judges even took some money from the workers to pay for the debts the managers made. There were no doubts why this man was having his way more than fair share of BS. He kept thanking me for what I had done, that he was feeling horrible, and how his son was absolutely loving his brand new instrument. The three of us went to a bar and had a coffee and chatted for a bit. At the end of the day, the entitled dad was really just a parent struggling to get by month to month. I know what it feels like. I've been through some stuff myself, and I know how you can end up being a total jerk when you see no way out of your situation. I'm glad that it all sorted itself out in the end. They were genuine and good people, just having a rough time, and I couldn't be happier knowing that, maybe, I bought the next Steve Vai's first guitar. Speaking of guitars, do you play any instruments yourself? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got, we don't discriminate here, ma'am. First post here, but I never thought I'd have to since Karens are uncommon in our poor country. 
This was just a few hours ago, and it didn't happen to me, but I was there when it did. There's this small supermarket I pass by on my daily commute. It's a small, two cashier lane, higher priced store that's located right beside a rich gated community. Anyways, I frequent this store just to get their imported sodas that aren't commonly found elsewhere. It was a slow day and there were two people in front of me in the payout while the other lane was closed. Understandable as there were only three paying customers. Here enters the cast. We've got me. We've got poor guy. We've got Karen. We've got the store clerk. Here I was, just waiting for my turn and looking out the window, and when I look back, a Karen had somehow teleported beside me as if to take my spot. I look at her directly and step back in line as the guy before me moves. I was now second in line, with only two bottles to buy, but I hear an irritated huffing noise. Poor guy walks by, wearing an electrician's overalls colored orange and gray. All the store employees wore black pants, a white shirt, and a black apron. The Karen grabs his arm and complains. Why are you people not opening the other cashier? It's a big lane and you're making us wait. She spoke English, but we're in Asia. Everybody here speaks English fine, but it's kind of snobbish in a casual setting. Poor guy says in our language, sorry ma'am, but I'm also just a customer. Karen, oh, sorry, sorry. She sounded sincere. Poor guy bows his head twice and walks away to get stuff. Meanwhile, she looks back irritated and finds store clerk to question. Hey, why is there only one lane open? We're waiting here. And besides, points with her lips to poor guy. Why do you let people like that in here? I turn back as I hear this. The store clerk, with dead eyes as if having to put up with this regularly, speaks in a solid and clear monotone. Store clerk in our language. Ma'am, we don't discriminate against selling to less fortunate people here. Everybody stops for a bit and I stifle a laugh. I turn around to see the second lane open up. I start paying for my two bottles, but I hear the Karen place her things sheepishly behind me. I turn around and give her a deadpan look. I take my stuff with a chuckle and walk out. Kudos to you, store clerk. Next we've got, Entitled Teacher Takes My Laptop and Accuses Me of Cheating. So it's exam season and I'm in the extra care group. This group requires a bit of a boosty during an exam and for me, I require a laptop and a lone space. I have a few psychological issues and my hands are incredibly shaky constantly, so I use a laptop for all of my exams rather than handwriting it. I have been since year 9 and I'm currently year 13. One major issue with me is I can't think straight unless I talk out loud. I can do this in a hushed whisper, but it's why I have to be alone. I'm seated at the back of a large hall with my computer far away from everyone else so I can freely explain my thoughts to myself while tapping away. Before I get on with this story, I should explain Mr. M. Mr. M is a high-end teacher with two students in this school. Neither are important for this story. Mr. M prioritizes those students heavily and puts them in the best classes whenever he could, the classes I was in. They always got the top marks and were always winners in some sort of contest. I, being the quiet-minded kid who focused much more on daydreaming about Hulk fantasies, didn't care too much about these brats. I just kept on keeping on. Well, until today. I was in my history exam quietly tapping away. I was also whispering to myself as I did it, telling myself what to write as I typed. But I felt something. A very sharp tap. I looked up to see Mr. M glaring at me sharply. I didn't understand what I did wrong, so went back to silently tapping, struggling much more as I'm still very anxious about my thinking issue. Another hard tap. I turn back to him and he hisses some sort of nonsense about me cheating. I remain silent. I would never cheat in an exam. Even if I was struggling so bad, why would he accuse me of it now? The silence persisted until he muttered something about having special treatment and his son requiring the laptop and before I could respond, he had picked it up and began walking away. Now all of this was done in a very quick and quiet movement. I couldn't react. I just sat in stunned silence. My work was gone. I had been working on this exam for an hour. I wanted to break down and cry. This was all too much for me. I was lucky Mrs. D, the one who was in charge of the exams, quickly noticed my lack of a computer. Mrs. D was the one who gave me the computer in the first place, so she knew something was up. She told me to go with her as she took me outside where I explained everything. The lack of computer, Mr. M accusing me of cheating, 
being kicked out of the exam hall, everything. She listened contently, then told me to stay there and went off somewhere. From what I was told from a teacher who heard the commotion, Mrs. D had tore him a new one. She berated him for ruining my exam and stealing my property without any knowledge of my conditions. She eventually returned to me with the laptop and my memory drive, luckily he hadn't removed it, and gave me an extra time slip for 15 minutes. Luckily, I was able to get the exam completed, even though it left me a bit shaken up. I haven't seen Mr. M for the rest of the day, and I noticed his class was taken by a sub for this lesson. Maybe some action was taken against him. Update. I got information. Oh boy, have I got a story for you. Turns out he's been confiscating work off others and giving it to his kids to hand in. Mr. M has been removed from the college and is not allowed to teach anywhere in my country's region or the regions nearby. His kids have also been expelled due to constant cheating. He's been replaced on the exam board by a very sweet lady who I had watch over me in my media exam. I need an invigilator near me while working due to some of my issues. I'm very happy I have friends in high places so I know about all of this and can tell you all. And hopefully, I'll not see him ever again. Next we've got, other coffee shops work like this, so yours should too. I worked at a gourmet coffee shop a few years ago. If you wanted a coffee, you would order, pay, then I would hand you a cup and you would pour the coffee and add the cream slash sugar yourself, other than having to do the odd sandwich slash espresso. It was a pretty easy job. A group of four people came in, they're dressed in suits, and just give off that aura of, I'm better than you. Three of them sit at a table, and the fourth comes up to the register. Me. Hi, can I help you? Him. Hi, I would like four coffees, please. Me. Sure, what size? Grande. We are not Starbucks. Oh, do you mean large? Sure, whatever. The first will be decaf, three cream. The second, me. Actually, the coffee and cream is on the table right behind you. I put the cups on the counter. Me. You just pour it yourself. Him. You don't pour it for us? Nope. But this way you can make it just the way you like it. Not the first time I've said this. And you can even get a free refill. Him. Can you just do it for us, please? Sorry. That's not how we work here, unfortunately. He huffs. Ugh. Well, I guess we'll just have to do it ourselves then. He grabs the cups and starts to walk back to his table. Me. Hey, sorry. That's actually going to be $6. Oh, we'll just pay you afterwards. We actually ask for it up front, if you don't mind. Him. We go to that other place up the street all the time. They don't charge us until afterwards. Me. Unfortunately, we're not them. If we get busy, you could easily just walk out without paying. Ugh, fine. He slams down exactly $6. There, are you happy now? Yep, thank you very much but we are probably never coming back here again. He heads to his table, and I can hear them loudly talking. We have to pour it ourselves? Are they going to pay us to do it? Let's go to the other place next time. As they filled up their coffees, one of them quirked. I guess I'm going to be the employee of the month here now. They stayed for about half an hour and made sure they all refilled their coffees before they left. I quit shortly after that, not because of them, so not sure if they ever came back or not. Speaking of coffee, do you drink coffee yourself? If so, how do you take it? Please leave a comment letting me know. Karen tries to take my 10,000 euro telescope. I am into stargazing and deep sky photography, like the Andromeda Galaxy, since I was about 8 years old and acquired quite a bit of hardware over the years. My most expensive setup is my deep sky photography setup, which cost around 10,000 to 12,000 euro to buy new. It is also my smallest setup as I picked it to be mobile and lightweight so it looks rather unimpressive. Also important, it can only be used for photography. You cannot look through it by yourself so it's useless without a very decent camera. Usually I carry two other setups with me, one with a high focal length and one with a short one. Both are Dobler telescopes which mainly means they are very stable but heavy as heck, 43 and 54 kilograms in total. Both, all in all, roughly 2,000 euro. Once a year, I go on a camping trip with my best friend to Finland. We enjoy the low light pollution and the cold weather a lot. We usually set up the telescopes right at the start and leave the two big ones outside for the whole duration of the stay 
and have the expensive one out only when we need it. It is quite normal that people are very interested and we are more than happy to show and explain to them the basics, even though most are disappointed by the huge quality difference between what you see on a photo and with the naked eye. On to the story. We had all telescopes out, hoping to stack some nice M31 images and get a few good looks. Just as we started, a mother and her daughter came up to us. She asked us what we were doing and my friend happily explained it to them and showed them some closer stuff in one of the telescopes while I was preparing the photography setup and programming everything. This went on for a few minutes and after a while, the mother jokingly, not really, suggested that we should give her daughter one of our telescopes as we are only two people and do not need three telescopes. We explained to her that the different body types are for different applications, thus we need all. We also told her that our telescopes are quite expensive but that she could buy her daughter some beginner ones for around 200 to 400 euro. Of course, she was not going to have that and told her daughter to test the small, expensive and just set up telescope. I could luckily stop her before she did any harm to my aim and explained the price of the setup and that our time actually runs short and we need to start soon. Of course, she did not believe a single word I said and claimed it would be a 50 year old toy and perfect for her daughter, but we eventually got rid of her, just a little bit after schedule, which is fine for such objects. We went on with our night, had some successful shots, and somewhere around 1 am decided it's time to go to sleep. So I quickly took the photography set up in the car and blocked the Dobbler mounting to its corresponding telescope so it cannot be moved anymore unless you move it all at once. Self-made locking mechanism, very proud. We went to our tents and while my friend was probably already sleeping, I was still on my phone for an hour or so until I heard some noise outside. Hoping it would either be people seeing the northern lights or some wild animal like a fox, I got my shoes and sneaked outside just to see a small person in the dark, desperately trying to carry our biggest 54 kilogram telescope away. It took me a second to understand what was going on and as I realized it, the person saw me as well and just went off as if nothing ever happened in a fast pace. Sadly, I was not fast enough in my thinking to follow the person, but I am still absolutely certain it was the mother who was trying to steal one of our telescopes and as we would not give her the small one, which she thought is cheap, she decided she would take the biggest one, which was actually the cheapest, but looks the most expensive due to its size. We have been very lucky that no calibrations were needed after the rough handling, as every single screw has to be perfectly accurately set, which can take hours without the right equipment. And we also have been very lucky to never see that woman and her daughter ever again. For our next holiday, I am getting us a long stainless steel chain so we can lock the two big telescopes together for some extra security. Thank you for reading my first ever bad camping experience. May this never happen to any of you. Do you have a telescope or have you ever looked through one? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got Karen thinks I work there, loses it when I help her anyway. So I don't know why, but for some reason it seems like everywhere I go, I get asked if I work there. For reference, I'm a dress comfy type of person and I live in southern Florida. So on normal days, when I'm just out doing whatever and not working, you can usually find me in capri workout slash yoga pants and a t-shirt of some sort and flip flops. Maybe it's because I keep my phone on a clip on my side since those kinds of pants usually don't have pockets. Heck, I don't know. Most of the time when people ask and I smile and politely say, I'm sorry, no, and they apologize sheepishly and walk away. Except this lady. Cast. We've got Entitled Woman, we've got Entitled Woman's Husband, and we've got me. So I was out shopping at a thrift store because I like to go find things to buy and fix up or use to make other things as a side gig for some extra money. I'm minding my own business, looking through clothing that I could use as fabric for a project when this lady walks up to me. I should mention that this particular thrift store has another thrift store literally next door. There's just a fence that separates the two parking lots and buildings. Entitled woman. Excuse me? You. I turn and look at her, questioningly, I'm sure. She's probably in her 60s or 70s, well-dressed, 
Typical South Florida snowbird from the looks of it. Her husband is half following her, half looking at stuff along the way as she's coming towards me. Entitled woman. Do you work here? Before I can even answer. Do you know, is today the all clothes are one dollar day? That lady over there, gesturing to nobody in particular, said it was. Me. Actually, I don't work here. But this store doesn't do that. That's the store next door. I think they do have that going on today because it's this day of the week, but I haven't been over there yet. She doesn't even acknowledge that I've spoken to her. No thank yous, sorry for bothering you, nothing, and walks away. I let it go, no big deal, I just answered her question, whatever. Well, that should have been the end of it, and aside from being a bit irritating that she couldn't be bothered to acknowledge that I'd spoken to her or anything else, again, no big deal. About 15 minutes later, her husband walks over to where she's at, about three racks away from me, still looking through clothes. Entitled woman's husband. What the heck, entitled woman? What in Sam heck are you doing with all those clothes? I see she has a cart literally overflowing with clothing items. What? They're only a dollar. That girl that works here just told me that. Points at me. Entitled woman's husband. Like heck she did. You must be deaf. That girl told you that the dollar clothes were next door. I was standing right there when she said it. They don't do that here. Entitled woman. Well, she's the one that said they were. I don't want all this stuff at regular price. She pushes her cart pretty hard at me. Since you told me they were a dollar and they're not, you can put them all back. Me. I didn't and I still don't work here. I told you that as well when you clearly weren't listening. She turned on her heel and stomped out. Her husband just kind of looked at me like, what the heck, before I could see his expression turn to anger and he quickly went after her. She didn't come back in, but I did see them outside in the parking lot when he went out after her and it looked like she was getting a pretty good earful from him. I felt bad and asked the lady that did work there if she wanted help putting the stuff up. Her response? No you don't work here. We laughed a bit as she rang me out and I went on my way. But seriously, where are these people raised to think that behavior like that is acceptable? I really want to know. Do you have any idea where people like this are raised? If so, please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got, Karen causes me extra hours of work because the sound was too loud for her little angel. A little bit of backstory. I do the projection in the church and occasionally the lights. I am 15 years old and I love tech. I use a Mac to do the projections of the songs in the church and have had a few encounters with entitled people, but this one is the cream of the crop. There are two places where we have services. One is for the kids, about 200 of them, and the other for the adults, about 1,000. While there are always three techies present in the services for the adults, but mostly one techie for the kids. I do the light there when I'm alone and the projection and someone sets up the sound and then leaves. That person is the sound guy. This day, there was just a service for the kids and that's why I was alone. There's a cable that goes from the Mac straight up for 7 meters and it's attached to the ceiling. It has never been an issue before. We've got me, we've got entitled daughter, we've got entitled mother. The techies, people who do sound and projection and lights, have a podium with two openings on the side and a large desk where all equipment needed stands on. The Mac is in the middle, so that's where I sat. Let's get on with the story, shall we? The sound techie already set up all the audio and everything was good to go. I don't know anything about the sound. I set up the lights, different colors, etc., and the projection. First encounter. Entitled daughter comes up to the podium and says, Turn the lights down. Really entitled. I say no. She says, why? And I say, well, the lights are not too bright, and it looks better this way. She was disappointed, but she sat down. Second encounter. Entitled daughter comes up to me again, and she says, the music is too loud. Really loudly, when she was only two meters away from me. The sound wasn't really that loud, so I said, no, it's perfectly fine. She said, you're annoying. Really loudly, and went angrily back to her seat. Then, after 10 minutes, she got up and left. I thought nothing of it, as she probably had to go to the bathroom. But she came back with her mom. Enter Entitled Mom. She was rocking the Karen haircut and had this angry expression on her face 
and she was coming straight towards me. She said, Turn the volume and the lights down. I said, No, I'm not allowed to touch the sound mixer, and even if I was, I still wouldn't do it, and I won't turn the lights down. Then Entitled Mom said, Fine, I'll do it myself. She came up to the podium, and I said, You can't come here and I guarded the tech by standing in front of her when she was trying to get past me. The singers were still singing, but I couldn't do the text because I had to stop Entitled Mom. The text is really important because it's what allows everyone to sing along. But I heard the kids not singing anymore because they didn't know what to sing. The Mac requires my constant focus to do the projection and this Entitled Daughter came from the other opening while I was holding her mom back and trying to calm her down. She was screaming and saying, let me turn it down. Let me turn it down for my little angel. And she was making quite a scene. Now I saw the entitled daughter from the corner of my eye tugging a rope that went all the way to the ceiling. My brain took 10 seconds to process this. But it was too late. The entitled daughter tugged so hard the whole cable came down with the projector and it fell 7 meters. I ran to entitled daughter and said, What did you do? Now the entitled mom was pulling the cables out of the back of the audio mixer and screaming at me for not listening to my elders. While I was focusing on the entitled daughter and heard a loud screech from all boxes, I had to run behind the podium to flip the main electric switch from that hall to not let the horrible sound continue. Now some of the people went to entitled mom and entitled daughter while they were trying to steal the Mac and held them while someone else called the police. Afterwards, me and five other techies had to hire a platform to get everything to the ceiling again. And we were busy for hours trying to get the software for the audio and lights and Mac back into working order. Speaking of Mac, what do you prefer? Mac or PC? Please leave a comment right now letting me know. Next we've got, couldn't be any more obvious. I had received my paycheck this Thursday and since my father was out of town for the week for work, I decided to help him out a bit more and buy his part of the groceries for the week along with my own. We usually go grocery shopping together on the weekends, but we each buy our own things since we eat different foods. Me saving up my money by getting basic ready to eat food like ramen noodles, potatoes, bread, eggs, stuff I know I can last a week with 10 bucks or so, while he spends a bit more for meat, vegetables, certain ingredients, etc. Since he'd be spending a bit more money on gas for the trip back home this Sunday, I figured he probably wouldn't have too much to spend for his groceries once he got back. So I wrote down a list on my phone of the things he usually gets when we shop. Luckily, he always buys pretty much the same stuff every week, so I know what to get. Fast forward to today, Friday morning. I get up pretty early to cash my check and head to the store near my house before the lines get pretty long as it would get colder later during the day when I'd have to return home. I make it to the store and it seems like it's about to start filling up, so I grab a cart and start making my way through the aisles and get what we need. I fill my cart pretty quick with what I need, walking along picking things off the shelf when I turn to the next aisle and see a woman with her cart parked sideways, blocking the area off as she looks up at an employee on a ladder reaching things off a high shelf, presumably for her. She's huffing and looking around impatiently, seemingly annoyed. I figure, poor guy, having to deal with entitled stuck up Karen, which was odd since she didn't look like a Karen. I turn my cart to go to the next aisle, hoping she wouldn't be blocking off the area once I returned. But because my cart was getting full, it was quite heavy and I slowly reversed and turned around. Unfortunately, I wasn't fast enough to leave and might have either made eye contact, she read my mind and noticed I called her Karen, or was annoyed that I sympathized with the employee and not her, because he was just an employee while she needed him to hurry up because she needed to pick up Jeffrey from soccer practice. Anyway, she noticed me and my turning my cart around as she turned and began speed walking towards me. At first, I didn't think anything of it. She probably saw something on a lower shelf she needed and went to pick it out. It was only when I was halfway in the next aisle when I heard her footsteps jog up next to me and grabbing my cart, actually calling out in a quite polite tone. Excuse me? I was surprised at first, wondering why she'd go out of her way to stop a complete stranger in a polite manner, especially from seeing her from afar looking peeved and annoyed at an employee mere seconds ago. I quickly stopped my cart before I accidentally hit her or run over her foot. 
as after grabbing my card, she stood in front of it. I thought, maybe it's an emergency. But again, why go up to a stranger when the store associate was right there? Either way, I'm always polite to everyone I meet, and thus the conversation begins. Me, caught off guard. Oh, yes? What's wrong? Can I help you? Karen, still sounding polite. Yes, I need your help. Me, what is it? Come with me. As she begins to walk away. Me, okay? I start slowly turning my card again to follow her. No, no, leave the card there. Me, confused, but still thinking she may need actual help with something. Leave my cart to the side so I don't block the aisle and follow her. Oh, okay. Karen leads me to the previous aisle she was blocking and her tone of voice changes. Go get another ladder and help out your fellow associate here. He's having trouble taking items off the shelf quickly and I want to get to the checkout line before it gets too long. You can finish stocking things later. Me, letting out a small chuckle. Oh, sorry. I don't actually work here. I'm actually doing my own shopping. Karen. Oh, please. I'm sure you can spare a bit of your time helping me out. Just get a ladder and help me with the things I need off those high shelves. Stocking everything doesn't take so long. I'm sure you've been here all morning putting things away anyway. Me. I can't help you with that. Sorry, I don't work here, like I said. I'm actually just a customer, just like you. Maybe you can find an actual employee, or I can walk around shopping, and if I see someone, I can tell them someone needs assistance in your aisle. Karen, look, I really don't have time for this. Either get another ladder, or leave if you don't want to help. The actual employee that was up on the ladder must have finally looked down, as I'm sure he was still picking her items or moving some stuff around, and pointed out to Karen. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. He's not an employee. Karen looked up at him, then back at me, and finally noticed that I, in fact, wasn't an employee. The employee uniform at this store is a blue collar shirt with black dress pants and black dress shoes. I was wearing black jeans with a tear in the knee, white sneakers, a black t-shirt with a tuxedo design, and a gray hoodie and a beanie. I understand me walking around quickly with a cart full of stuff may look like I'm a stalker trying to work quietly, but as for the uniform, I have no idea. Karen, looking a bit embarrassed. Oh, sorry. Me. No, no, it's okay. It's all right. I make my way back to my cart and proceed to finish up my list and head to checkout, pay, and head on home. It was nice in a way to see a Karen quickly turn from snobby and stuck up to genuinely apologetic for making a mistake and owning up to it. Although rare, not the first time I've seen a Karen but definitely my first interaction with one. Next we've got, undercut me on a job by doing poor work? Okay, just wait and see. I was an observer in this whole affair, but to say I didn't enjoy the heck out of it would be a lie. Company A did fencing, walls, barriers, etc. Company A was run by Bob. Bob was a real upstanding guy, took over the business from his father and really grew it into something big. Bob had an employee, Jake, Jake had been with Company A for quite a few years, but Bob and Jake always rubbed off on each other in the wrong ways. Bob always felt like Jake was the king of shortcuts and shoddy workmanship. When Bob took over the company from his dad, Bob applied more pressure on Jake to bring up the quality of his work or be let go. Eventually, Jake got tired of the increased pressure and quit and formed his own fencing company called Company B. Here is where I come in. I started a job in a company providing business services to small to medium-sized businesses in the area and both Company A and Company B became my clients. This was several years after Company B had formed. From my outside viewpoint, Company A was that local company that's been around forever that does good quality work that you can trust, but they aren't going cheap. They never try to be cheap, but you can trust them. Company B was the young startup who is cutting corners and being competitive in every way possible, often by lying or misleading its customers. That's when Company C comes in. Company C was building a production facility in the area and wanted a wall with gates around its new production facility. This was going to be a big contract, and really the only two players in the area that could possibly do this job was Company A or Company B. This contract was worth a lot. If my memory serves me correctly, the job was somewhere near seven figures. Company A and Company B went to go bid. 
Company B came in at like a 30% lower price point, and even though Bob tried to explain it wasn't possible for Company B to do the work that was promised at the price point that was given, of course money talks and Company B got the contract. I remember Bob was furious in his eyes. He felt what Jake was doing was wrong. He didn't mind fair competition, but Jake's MO has always been way underbid, overpromise, rely on cost overruns to make a profit. Bob's opinion on business was a price is a price, and if he says he's going X for Y, he's going to do X for Y, even if he loses money. It's how he was raised. Some time goes by, and Bob gets a call from Company C. They've apparently fired Jake and his company due to not being able to do the work required and ask Bob if he can come in and fix the mistakes. Bob agrees and gets the job done. At this point, Bob starts thinking, he's got to take Jake out. Jake is taking too much money out of his pocket. Bob comes up with the idea of buying Jake out, but Bob knows if he approaches Jake, regardless of what he offers to pay, Jake is going to say no. So Bob has got to be smart. Bob is talking to me about this during one of our meetings. We had become quite close, and I tell Bob, I bet there are lawyers out there who specialize in helping other companies acquire other companies. Bob asks me if I know of any. I don't, but I did have a client who specialized in business law who would be more familiar with this whole thing. I give Bob his contact info and Bob thanks me. Bob contacts the lawyer and tells the lawyer what he would like to do. The lawyer tells Bob a lawyer who used to work for him now works for a firm that specializes in mergers and acquisitions and if Bob wanted to buy out Jake's company, he's confident this firm could get it done. Also, this firm was in the big city, far away from the small community, so it's unlikely Jake would know what's truly going on. Bob contacts the firm and says he wants to buy out his competitor and would like to enlist their services. Now this is already getting a bit longer, so I'll get to the point. This firm ended up buying Jake's company, lock, stock, and barrel, and gave the company to Bob. All the while, Jake was completely oblivious to the fact that his arch enemy had just acquired his very own company. I recall Bob describing to me the day he walked into Jake's company with such delight. Bob was told he owned the company. Jake had been paid and was expecting to meet the new owner of the company that pleasant Monday morning. Jake was given the title of general manager and was considered second in command now. So Bob walked into the building that once belonged to Jake with his documents and the lawyer that had helped him acquire the firm, who Jake was familiar with. Bob walked into Jake's office to Jake's surprise. Jake. Hi, Bob. Bob. Hi, Jake. How are you? I'm good. What are you doing here? Oh, nothing much. Just thought I'd come check out my newly acquired business. Jake. Huh? Bob. Jake, you sold your company to me. I did what? No, I didn't. I sold it to XYZ. XYZ is the law firm I hired to organize the transaction. I am now the owner. Jake. That's BS. Bob. Here's your documents. Lawyer who Jake was familiar with confirmed this was all true. So you're now my boss? Yes. Now get up. That's my chair and I'm tired. I want to sit down for a minute. Jake. This is my office. Bob. This is my company. And I have decided that this office is now my office, so I'm going to need you to get out of my chair. Jake gets out of the chair. Great. Well, have a seat, Jake. Jake. Thanks. Bob. Jake, I think the first order of business today is getting rid of redundancies. What do you mean? Well, you see, Jake, whenever a company acquires another company, you get overlap, redundancies, two HR departments, two secretaries, two accountants, etc. But now it's all one company. So now you got redundancies, overlaps, which is quite frankly a waste of money. Jake. Yeah? Bob. And I don't need two owners working for one company. And he laughs and told me he had the biggest grin on his face. Jake, it's become apparent that your services are no longer required and effective immediately, you are terminated. Jake protested. Bob. The decision is final. You may collect your personal belongings and leave the premises. What time did you get into work this morning? 7 a.m. Great. So you've been here for two hours. I'll make sure payroll pays you for two hours on the agreed upon rate and the buyout agreement. Have a nice day. Jake. So you're just firing me? Just like that? Yep. Should have done this long ago. What about my family? Jake, I just bought your company from you and paid you a lot of money. You'll be fine. 
Now get out of my office and out of my building. And that is how Bob acquired and fired an employee he should have fired long before. Some background. I remember the day vividly when Bob scheduled an appointment with me to go over Company B services and negotiate a new service contract with us. It was the day Bob had fired Jake. Bob was in a great mood, one of the best moods ever. We did the business we needed to handle and Bob said, PJ, you helped me a lot get this all done. I'd like to invite you out to dinner and drinks and let's watch Monday Night Football together. I really hadn't. I said, Bob, I really didn't do much. He said, oh yes you did. You pointed me in the right direction. I go, well, that's the least I could do. He said, very well. Still, I'd like to take you out to dinner and drinks if that's all right with you. Now, I'm not one to turn down free beer and food, so I agreed. And that night, Bob and I went to a local hangout and watched Monday Night Football and ate and drank as Bob recounted this whole experience with such joy. Bob later rebranded Jake's company as a commercial-only enterprise and refocused his main company on residential and both companies still exist today and are run by Bob and his son now. Karen was my principal. So my high school reunion is coming up this year and I've already received my invitation to RSVP ahead of time in the mail. I didn't really enjoy high school, so I might not go. That is a story for another subreddit. This is the story about how an entitled woman became our principal and made everyone miserable. So my sophomore year, an old principal finally retired. He had been there for years. It was just time for him to retire. Now we all thought the job would go to the assistant principal. He was qualified for the job, well liked by the students, and he also had been there for years. For this story, I'll call him Mr. Cool. Mr. Cool was liked by everyone. He would loan students lunch money if they needed it, sign permission slips, give us a pass if we were running late for class for a reason like we couldn't get our locker open or we got held up in another class and would even perform magic tricks. We thought he would be the new principal. Nope. Somehow, our entitled woman snatched the job. I will call her Karen. Karen was just a horrible person. We don't even know how she got the job. Rumor had it, she used her husband's position as member of the school board to get the job. Possible this is true, but I am not sure. My little town does do some shady stuff. Karen immediately started enacting strict and harsh rules on us. Here are some that I remember. 1. If you were late to lunch, you didn't eat. In her words, you should have been here before the doors closed if you were hungry. 2. No more vending machines. We had a small area by the auditorium that had a couple soda machines and three snack machines. We were only allowed in the area during free time between lunch and our fourth hour class or after school. She had the machines removed, saying the reason was, we don't need to be eating that junk food. Instead, she set up a table with things like bottled water and fresh fruit. No one really bought it since a bottle of water was $3.50 when at the machine, it would have only cost us 75 cents. Drinks now had to be inspected by teachers. It was a very stupid rule. She claimed that students had been sneaking things in and pretending it was water. If you had a drink with you, first you showed it to your teacher. They all got tiny plastic cups to take a small sample and drink it to test it. You then got a small note to show other teachers the drink passed. The rule was ridiculous. Many of the teachers didn't do it. They knew we were good kids. Seniors could no longer wear their class slash letterman jacket. This rule upset everyone. As a senior, if you had bought a class jacket or earned a letterman from sports or clubs, you were allowed to wear it as part of your school uniform. She banned this. You got sent to the office if you were caught wearing it on school grounds. The jackets could even be confiscated. The list goes on. I could go on all day listing the crazy things this lady did. It was that bad. School became miserable. She even had cameras set up near the bathrooms to catch us smoking. No one smoked since all the bathrooms had smoke detectors. If you smoked, you went behind the music building like everyone else. Anyway, my senior year, Karen went full on crazy. There were cameras everywhere now. New rules like no talking between classes and no backpacks. I couldn't wait to graduate. Now while I was a sophomore, a girl in the freshman class was in a boating accident. My senior year, a group of students, including myself, got together to make shirts to remember her. 
They wanted to wear them to school, so of course we needed Karen's permission. The shirts weren't crazy, mind you. They were black, with the girl's picture on it saying something along the lines of that she hasn't been forgotten. We only wanted to wear them for one day. One day. We go to Karen's office, explain what we want to do, and ask if we can. She explodes on us. I'll cut her rant short. Karen, this is not part of the school uniform. Anyone caught with one of these shirts will be suspended for three days. Student, we just want to remember her. She would be a junior this year. We'll tuck them in as part of the uniform, and they are black. Our uniform was black, white, or green shirts. Karen, I said no. Do not bring them on school property. Honestly, you need to move on. Several students, including myself, left her office in tears over this. I even called my mom to pick me up because I couldn't stop crying. The next day, I found out that many students just walked out their classes and left. They performed a walkout in protest. Karen was furious. She gave some students like a month of detention for this. Furthermore, she doubled down on disrespecting students who had passed. When a member of the senior class passed due to cancer, she made an announcement saying, Anyone caught leaving flowers, notes, or idling around students' lockers will be sent to detention. This is a place of learning. You can mourn at home. Teachers were even told to send crying students to the office. They did not. Other members of staff tried to reason with her, including Mr. Cool. She threatens to have him fired. Anyone who tried to stand up to her was threatened with losing their jobs or being written up. Not even her own son was safe. She kicked her son out of the house when she learned he was dating a girl she didn't like. I wish I was making this up. His father divorced her. Her son was 16 and she kicked him out of her house because he refused to break up with the girl. Finally, by some grace of every god known to man, it's time for graduation. Now at my school, seniors got out of school two weeks early to handle our affairs. In those two weeks, we cleaned out our lockers, turned in books, got yearbooks, and there was a small ceremony for those who got scholarships. We also had to practice for the actual graduation ceremony. This meant spending hours in the hot Louisiana sun while we marched up and down the football field. Everything had to be perfect for Karen. Oh, and we already had been warned not to throw our hats. Anyone caught throwing their caps after the ceremony will not be given their high school diploma. And I'll be calling your parents. Karen was at every practice. One of the students was heavily pregnant and asked to sit down once to rest. Karen, not my fault you got pregnant. If you don't practice, you will not be walking come the ceremony. I better not see you sitting or slowing down everyone else. How our blood boiled at this. Oh no, hold on, it gets even worse. You've read this much, so let me put the cherry on top of her entitlement cake. Our class valedictorian had cerebral palsy. Now, he had the highest GPA in the whole school. A perfect GPA. Smart as a whip and super nice, sweet, and everyone loved him. Every girl said he was their boyfriend. The valedictorian always gives the speech and helps hand out the fake paper diplomas for the ceremony. Now, he was in a wheelchair as he could no longer walk on his own and had an assistant to help him get back and forth from classes. Karen told everyone that he would not be allowed to give his speech or allowed on the stage. Why? He doesn't speak very loudly. No one in the crowd will be able to understand what he says because of his disorder. Someone else will have to read the speech and assist in handing out diplomas. Everyone, and I do mean everyone, including members of the staff and my senior class, refused to read the speech or take his place. He had earned being valedictorian. We told our parents, who went to the school board. I wish I could say Karen was fired, but she wasn't. Instead, she was just forced to allow him on the stage to hand out the diplomas, but she didn't let him give his speech. Instead, she read it, which was heartbreaking for him. I was so happy to get away from that woman. As a last form of protest, when everyone had gotten their diplomas, we all threw our caps. Caps everywhere. We still got our diplomas. Today, Karen is no longer at the school. The story I heard was that she was fired after she humiliated a group of students in a school assembly over their weight. Parents got lawyers involved and the school board didn't want a lawsuit. Mr. Cool is acting principal. Sorry this is such a long story, but this woman was the one reason I didn't enjoy school. She was miserable and entitled 
who in turn forced everyone else to be miserable just like her. A monster of a Karen, drunk on the power of being able to control the lives of high school students. How messed up can you be? Edit. Since some people are messaging with questions as to how this all went on for a whole year and even beyond when I graduated, I decided to make an update. First, keep in mind that this town is small. Our population peaked when we reached 6,000. That makes us only number 57 in large cities in Louisiana. We are known for some shady, shady backroom local politics. This is how Karen was able to do the things she did to us with little to no consequences on her actions. She knew someone who knows someone who knows someone who can sweep this under the rug. The school board was known for letting things slide until they got enough angry phone calls from parents to try and do something to calm them down. Plus, my parents didn't believe some of the things that I had told them about. Your principal isn't denying students food, OP. Don't lie. I know high school is hard, but we have all been there before, blah, blah. They didn't believe a lot of stuff. That is possibly why it took so long for her to finally be fired. My niece is now a junior. Karen got fired when she was a freshman. I believe because a few of the students were military and thanks to the military base, our town gets extra income. They apparently got money for every military kid in the school. The last thing the school or town wanted was for the military to pull all those kids out of the school and send them to schools only on their base. They had threatened this before. The general at the time made it very clear he could have a high school built, staffed, and pull every military kid out of that school in a heartbeat. I know the story might not sound true, but I promise it is. Karen was bitter, entitled, and self-centered. She just hated everyone and everything. Have you ever had a teacher or a principal who was entitled? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got, I've given you my money, now do your job. Sir, you're not our customer. I work for one of the largest Scandinavian airlines at the check-in desks. I encounter some of humanity's worst on a daily basis, but this one in particular stood out to me. It started when I noticed that my coworker at the desk next to me was being berated by this older man. There were no passengers waiting to be checked in at the time, so I ended up listening in on the conversation. In a strangely calm tone, this man was letting out a steady stream of accusations mixed in with total nonsense. Man, I will be contacting all the newspapers to let them know about how you are scamming people out of their money. This is your responsibility to fix, so you will have to fix it. Coworker, I'm very sorry. However, due to this ticket, I gave you my money. So are you going to fix this? This conversation kept looping pretty much exactly like this over and over without my coworker ever getting enough time to explain the problem to the passenger without being cut off. I quietly asked coworker if he needs me to call for a supervisor, but to my surprise, he responded that everything was going great with a grin on his face. With me butting in into the conversation, it finally created enough room for my coworker to finally explain to the passenger what the problem was. Coworker, Sir, you are traveling with R Air, established Irish low-budget airline. We work for S Air. What do you want us to do? Without hesitation, the older man continues to tell coworker off. It is S Air that got my money, so it's your people who are going to fix my ticket. Coworker, there's nothing we can do with this ticket as it's for a different airline that we have no affiliation with. If you want our help, you will have to visit our ticket office. He points in the direction of the ticket office. Man, I've already given you my money. Why would I give you even more? At this point, it's been over 20 minutes of this and both me and coworker are starting to get fed up by this man's antics and I walk around the corner to stand next to the man. I gesture towards the ticket office and as politely yet forcibly as I possibly could, I shut down the conversation by telling him that there is nothing we can do for him at the check-in counter and that he will have to go to the ticket office for help. He grumpily starts walking towards the office while continuously telling us how bad at our job we are. And that was the end of it. Or so I thought. About an hour passes by and I've switched over to helping people out with the self-check-in machines. I'm having a conversation with my supervisor about nothing of any importance when suddenly the man returns. He immediately makes a beeline to my supervisor and starts his rambling again, with the only addition from the previous ramble being him telling her how we had apparently managed to talk to the boss. He made air quotes as he said this, about something. He started to become illegible at this point, 
but he pretty much regurgitated the conversation we had earlier. My supervisor immediately realizes what kind of situation it was and pretty much ended up ignoring him, helping another passenger who was an actual customer of ours, leaving him to continue complaining to the only other worker there, me. Man, this is nothing personal towards you, but and the previous beratements continues on loop again with another addition that airlines should not be allowed to sell tickets through mobile apps and that he is going to contact politicians about it to change the rules and that he is going to speak to the president of the S Air so that he, the president of S Air, can talk to the president of R Air so that he, the president of R Air, had to speak to his employees about how to treat their customers. Again, everyone he's spoken to up until this point works for S Air. Turns out, this man had bought a ticket with R Air through a travel agency without checking which airport the departure was from. The airport I work at does not have any R Air departures or arrivals at all. This man was at the wrong airport, demanding us to check him in at a different airline, refusing to believe us when we told him he's not our customer. In the end, he ended up just leaving. The funny thing is, he was only going to Copenhagen, which there are many very easy ways to get to. He ended up spending almost two hours at the wrong airport telling us to do someone else's job. Even if he had just bought another plane ticket or gotten on a much cheaper train, he would have been well on his way by then. Speaking of airlines, what was the last airline you flew on? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got Entitled Dad Tries to Date the Teacher Cast We've got Entitled Dad We've got Poor Kid who was most likely just doing what his dad told him We've got Awesome Teacher We've got Cool Principal We've got My Boyfriend And Me On to the story This started at the beginning of the school year I started as the English teacher's assistant We had classes from 4th grade to 6th grade Plus junior and senior year Obviously not every grade every day but rather usually two grades per day. Long story short, we had classes with fourth grade Mondays and Thursdays. My first Monday working starts and the English teacher, awesome teacher, the lovely old lady that helped me get the job, made it clear that just because I was young didn't mean that they wouldn't respect me and that I was going to also be helping them with school. Surprisingly, they are really nice and well behaved. It's usually from sixth grade up that I've seen kids start acting up. I tried to bond with all the students since I feel that it's better to gain their trust rather than just forcing them to work and then watch them struggle. Here is where I met poor kid. A week goes by and that's usually when we do a parent teacher meeting to discuss how kids have adapted. This is for kids from first to sixth grade. Awesome teacher wanted me to be in the meeting to learn how the dynamics work. Here is where we met entitled dad. Taken counts, he was in his early 40s and I had recently turned 18. Awesome teacher had gone to the bathroom when he came in and the conversation went somewhat like this. Entitled dad. Hi, so are you poor kid's teacher? Me. Oh no, sorry. She will be back in a second. Entitled dad. Wait, by any chance are you... My name? Yeah, that's me. No way. Poor kid was talking about this cool new teacher that he had. By the way, he was talking about how it would be nice if you could hang out with us sometime. Me. Visibly uncomfortable. Sorry, I'm just a teacher's assistant here, and it's my job to help students. Finally, awesome teacher walked in and talked to the entitled dad about poor kid's progress. Next day rolls by, and some students brought gifts for awesome teacher and me. Very common where we live, and most of them were small candies or chocolates. So, safe to say, kids at least liked me. Everything was okay until I saw the entitled dad again. English was the last class of their school schedule, 3 p.m., Awesome teacher stays with the class until they get picked up, but since I had the study group at 3.30, I usually left before most of the students. This day, however, Entitled Dad came to pick up poor kid early. Entitled Dad. So, did you get my number? Me. What? My number. It, it was in the chocolates I sent. Me. Sorry, but having that type of contact with the parents is unprofessional, and I'd rather you not continue with that attitude. Oh no, I was just wondering if you could tutor poor kid. He's been having trouble with English. It's barely week two, and no, poor kid was good at English. Me. I'm sorry, but I'm busy all week. If you would like a tutor, you have to discuss it with awesome teacher. But if you are free on weekends, you can come to our house. Quickly, I said I couldn't and left. For the next couple of weeks, he would pick up poor kid early and try to talk to me with the excuse of it being about poor kid's progress 
but he would try to bring up my personal life. Fast forward to second week of February. I get a friend request from none other than Entitled Dad. I have two accounts, one that I have pretty much anyone that I like to keep in contact with and a Finsta where I only have close friends. He tried to add me on my more open account and before I denied it, I saw a DM that basically gave me a sob story about him going through a tough divorce and that he only wanted to be in contact with me to discuss about poor kid and make sure the divorce didn't affect him. Me being dumb and naive, I accepted the request. It started more innocent, like, how was poor kid today? But he quickly brought up my personal life and started questioning about my boyfriend. Now that's another story on itself, but I'll write it for you to have context. Boyfriend and I officially started dating December 1st, 2018, but I was still working with improving my self-esteem and learning how not to normalize toxic behaviors. Boyfriend basically told me that he loved me, but wanted me to love myself first. And if that meant me wanting to be with other or not having to rely on a relationship, he would understand. So we went on a break before I started working, but still kept hanging out and occasionally cuddling. We officially got back together on February 14th, 2019. But during the first weeks of February, we were quite flirty IRL and online. Everything was normal with the entitled dad until he started asking if the messages I posted on social media were about him. I should have just blocked him, but every day he would bring up the sob story. These messages were random I love yous and I wish you were here on my Insta story. Yeah, I was that annoying jerk, but stopped asking when I started uploading photos with my boyfriend. I just ignored him until one day boyfriend came to my house and randomly asked if I knew a guy named Entitled Dad. I was like, yeah, that's the father from a kid in my class. Then he showed me all the threatening texts he had from him, most of them telling boyfriend to get away from me. Instantly, I confronted Entitled Dad by sending him the screenshots of his messages to boyfriend and finally blocked him from social media and told him that any further contact would be at school only. The only reason I didn't report him this time was that he gave me this sob story that he was still hurt by his ex and boyfriend's name was similar to the name of the guy his wife left him for and he sent the messages while drunk. Me, still being naive and believing that people always tell the truth, I just left him on scene. But the next incident was what set everything off. A couple of days go by and February 14th comes around. I was officially back with boyfriend and posted it on social media. I don't know how, but he still saw the picture, and the next day, I saw that I had texts from an unknown number. They were from Entitled Dad. Basically, he was saying how could I have cheated on him, and that I was supposed to be with him, and that I was a good motherly figure to poor kid. Instantly, I blocked him. Monday morning comes around. I printed all the conversations and showed them to principal. She was equally disgusted with this Entitled Dad and told me she would deal with the matter. Two days go by and I got called to principal's office. There was a woman I didn't know. Turns out this was poor kid's mom. The entitled dad wasn't divorced. And from this brief meeting, I could tell the woman was really nice. Principal made sure to tell her that this incident was started by entitled dad and that I had blocked him and reported the incident. But I felt bad for this woman because she said that entitled dad had cheated on her multiple times, but she didn't leave him because of poor kid and because he was their main source of income. After they left, Principal told me what happened. She threatened to call the cops on Untitled Dad if he still tried to contact me outside of school and told his wife of the problem. He stormed out, furious, and took poor kid out of school the first week of March. Apparently, they were moving to a safer part of the country. That's the last thing I knew about them. I just hope that poor kid and his mother are in a better place right now. Next we've got Entitled Jerk Calls Cops on Us During a Fishing Tournament this happened a few years ago when me and one of my close friends were in a fishing tournament that my mom had recommended for us to compete in. Everything was going good. We sat through the briefing, had a small breakfast, and set up for the big launch. After the air horn went off, I floored it while we were jamming out to Katy Perry and ACDC. We get to the spot that we had scoped out the week before. It was a sunken boat near, laying about 10 feet down, and it was sitting on an edge so it was prime territory for big bass. The tournament had allowed us to catch all bass, even stripes, and me and my friend were excited. We unbuckled our life vest, and I throw my friend his pole and grabbed mine. Our plan was for me to fish the edge with a jig, and my friend would fish with a jerk bait on top. Well, two hours pass, and we've caught our limit, and we're now just fishing to replace the smaller ones in the tank. 
We're still jamming out to music when I hear the roar of a boat engine behind us and my friend heard it as well. We looked to see if it was one of our friends who were also in the tournament and we would regularly check on each other to see if we're doing good. But it was this younger guy, probably late 20s, speeding towards us and we're waving at him thinking he didn't see us. He's speeding closer and closer, then turns off his engine and turned his boat as quickly as possible and is now only about 20 feet from us. I didn't say anything because I was focused on fishing. My friend asked, what's his deal speeding up to us like that? And the guy, and I quote, says, you're fishing in my water. I was confused because we're a good one half mile from any docks or houses. And my friend says, your water? It's a public lake. No, says entitled person. That's my boat under you. So it makes this my water. At this point, I was a little annoyed because I couldn't hear my music because of this guy yelling and he was probably scaring away the fish. I jokingly told him, you must be a few screws short to think that's a law. Entitled guy is now mad, saying, you're a few screws short, you brat. Entitled guy keeps saying more insults and my friend finally got annoyed and said, hey, you jerk, if you don't leave now, I'm swimming over to that boat and shoving your teeth down your throat. My friend was a linebacker for our school at the time, and he was pretty ripped and had a short temper, so I knew he was willing to swim over there. At this point, my friend was red with anger because he was mad this guy was messing with our spot and annoying us. My other friend, who was in the boat with his girlfriend at the point, saw our boat from across the way and pulled up to ask what was going on. I said, nothing much except for Miley over here ruining our time as I pointed over my shoulder. Well, Entitled Guy heard this and started yelling. I'll have you know, I graduated at my high school top of my class and got a full ride because of it. We all started laughing because it was the first time hearing an insult like that before. He was super confused and finally said, I'm calling the cops. My friend says, for what? Because we're fishing over your boat? Then we all laughed again. About 20 minutes later of arguing, the cops show up and Entitled Guy said, ha ha. Y'all will get what y'all deserve for laughing at me. We're not worried because we really haven't done anything wrong, except for my friend threatening him. I look over at the boat to see which cop it is because my buddy's girlfriend's dad was a cop that patrolled the lake. And sure enough, it's him. Me and the cop were already pretty good friends because he volunteered at the soap kitchen my friends and I volunteered at as well and we became good friends. He jokingly said, What trouble y'all getting into now? Disturbing the fishies? We all laughed, even his partners in the boat, except for Entitled Guy, who looked more upset than ever and screamed, Arrest them! The cop stayed pretty calm, and so did his partners. He calmly asked, What for? Entitled Guy's stupid response, Because I pay your paycheck, and they're fishing over my boat. And I kid you not, pointed at the water. The cop looked confused at first and said, Sir, that's not a crime. They're not fishing near a public dock or fishing near a public swimming area. They're not doing anything wrong. Now Entitled Parent is furious and is saying, I don't care. It's my boat and now my water. Arrest them or I'll call my dad. Still staying calm, the cop said, Well, we can't arrest them because you think so. An Entitled Guy said, Fine, forget all of you. And was about to drive off when one of the cops says, Why do you have beer bottles in your boat? Entitled Guy responds, None of your business. The cop tells him to stay there and pull over to his boat and told him to come on board. Surprisingly, he obliged. Entitled guy is now yelling, This is against the law to hold somebody in a boat without their permission. And the OG said, Not unless we have suspicions of what's on the boat. Entitled guy's face went blush, and the cops gave him a breathalyzer test, and then you hear the clicking of the handcuffs, and the cops saying he's under arrest. And they set him on the seat and searched the boat to find eight empty bottles. We're all just sitting there trying not to laugh. An entitled guy just bursts out. Forget you all! And started kicking. He kicked the cop and the other cops wrestled him and put him in ankle cuffs and something else that made it impossible for him to move. The cops politely asked if we could please go fish somewhere else while this is handled. We obliged since the cop was one of our friends and they were just doing their job. So we headed our separate ways and ended up winning the tournament that day. Karen's behavior ends up getting her fired. To set the scene, this restaurant is a local upscale sushi bar with dim lighting and high booths. Working as a server here, we also act as hosts, 
bussers, and bartenders. It's also important to note that the owner is also the manager and is at the restaurant 24-7. Literally, he lives there. And that these ladies all worked for a local business in which they had their work shirts on. This particular day, we were dead for lunch, and both me and my coworker were in the office talking to the owner. Three ladies walk in and seat themselves, ignoring the please wait to be seated sign. The phone rings, so my coworker leaves the office to answer, and it happens to be the three ladies sitting at the booth calling to get someone's attention. Which is fair enough, a little annoying, but effective. Coworker apologizes for the wait, takes their order, and goes about business. These ladies call her over to complain that they are on lunch and the food is taking too long. She apologizes and assured them it shouldn't be much longer. They then made a remark about having to call to get anyone's attention. This particular coworker is not someone who messes around. She has worked at the restaurant for years and is not the type to kiss someone's butt in these situations. Still, she kept her cool and walked off. The ladies got their food then proceed to walk up to the sushi bar to talk with the owner about how rude coworker is. Coworker overheard and walks over to join the conversation, which ends in yelling and two of the ladies asking her to go outside. I eventually am asked to bring them the bill. They pay, stay, and talk for a second and then leave. When we went to clean the table, these ladies had crushed up sushi rolls, left noodles and meat all over the table covered in teriyaki sauce with a note on the receipt that said, Dumb Jerk. The owner then proceeds to call their work and explain to the manager what they had done. The best part was they all paid separately and with debit cards, so we knew all of their names. A couple of hours later, a woman walks in, hands my coworker $50, apologizes for their behavior and explains that she is the business owner who had worked her way through college as a server. She then lets her know that she did not want these kinds of people representing her company and they had all been let go. This is one of my favorite stories from this crazy job and I have an enormous amount of respect for the owners of both businesses involved. If anyone is interested in more stories from this place, I have a book's worth of tales. If you had employees who worked for you and they acted like this in a restaurant, would you fire them for it? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got Entitled Parents Try to Kick Me Out of My Room I'm currently taking classes away from home and since I don't like the idea of living out of my car, I rented a room at a nearby bed and breakfast that houses students. Great owners, amazing rooms with private bathrooms, fast Wi-Fi, free use of state-of-the-art kitchen, and above all else, affordable. Of course, because the place I'm staying at is a B&B &B first, the owners request that I stay flexible during tourist seasons, which means I keep things at a ready-to-move status. Tourist patrons pay way more to stay here, so they take priority over room choice. Thankfully, tourist season only lasts from September 1st to October 22nd and from February 1st to the 18th and doesn't come without compensation. The owners have temporary rooms in their private residence, they call it the retreat, set up for students who have to move for tourists, as well as a contract stating that if any items left in our rooms are damaged or stolen by tourists, it will be fixed slash replaced. Well, it's tourist season again, thanks to the nearby town's winter and Valentine's festivals that happen every February. I've been moved once so far, but it wasn't too bad. The owners called all the students into the common room to explain the room situation for the coming days. Alrighty then. Housemate 1 and Housemate 2, you're going to stay the night up at the retreat. OP, you're the lucky one who gets to stay this time. Mind your manners and just do what you do. Later that day, I'm playing on my Xbox when I'm caught off guard as my door swings open and a family of three pour in. The lady sets down a couple of luggage bags while the kid starts running around the room. The mother takes one look at me and says, I was told that you'd be moved out by now. Why are you still here? I politely tell her that they may have the wrong room and that mine wasn't selected for patron use. That's ridiculous. I specifically requested this room. You better leave now or I'll be having a strongly worded conversation with the owner. I ask her to give me a second as I call up the owner. She gives me a, hmm, <clears throat> whatever. The owner picks up and I double check with him about my room. He confirms that they have the wrong room 
and that he'll be there shortly to work it out. I relay this information to the mother, who just doesn't accept this. This is stupid. I asked for this room, and I paid the fee. So you got to leave. Now! The kid finally notices my Xbox. Awesome! We have an Xbox while we stay here. Can I play it, Mom? Please? The mom agrees, totally ignoring the fact that she has no right to allow her kid to use someone else's things. I keep the controller away from the kid and say that if I'm leaving, I'll be taking my Xbox with me. Her brat did not like that answer and began to wail like a banshee. Now look what you've done. You've made my baby cry. He's going to be in a bad mood for the rest of our stay now. You better hope the owner is forgiving, because he's getting an earful when he shows up. All this is going on, and not a word has been breathed from the dad. He just stands behind his wife, arms crossed, and with a mildly discomforted look on his face. The owner finally shows up, and it goes like this. Hello folks, sorry for the mix-up. Your room is taken up by this punk. We know, but this is the room I asked for, and it's the room we're getting, or we'll find somewhere else. Ma'am, your bill states that you asked for room number four. This is room number five. I've already made the arrangements for room four to be used, so if you could just please follow me, we'll get your family set up. No, this room has an Xbox video game entertainer. Yes, she called it that. And my son wants to use it while we stay here. It's this room or nothing. You'll be hard pressed to find another place with vacancy during the festival. Besides, it's just down the hall and it's just as nice of a room. Does it have an Xbox? I don't think. Then it's this room or we take the Xbox with us. I interject, saying that no one is taking or using my Xbox without my permission. Why do you even have that thing anyways? You look like an adult, act like one and quit playing childish video games. Ma'am, it's room four or nothing, and I can assure you, it's not gonna be easy to find a new place to stay. Even if you did, it won't be as nice as here. Fine, I'll take it, but don't expect a review over three stars. She stomps out of the room, wailing brat and pack mule husband in tow. The owner gives me a yeesh look before apologizing and closing the door. That was two days ago, and they're still down the hall from me for another two days. The kid has had at least four very audible temper tantrums since then. God have mercy. Speaking of Xbox, what do you prefer? Xbox or PlayStation? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got, do you check everyone's cart like that? I work at a warehouse chain that requires a membership to shop, and I'm trained in a variety of departments. One of them is front door asset protection. We check receipts at the door of the store. This is not so much to prevent theft as it is to prevent shrink from cashier error. 99% of people are cooperative, even when there is a mistake on their receipt. Cast. We've got me. We've got customer service desk employee one, a close friend of mine. We've got customer service desk employee two. We've got rude lady and rude lady's friend. The story. Today, I was scheduled the closing shift checking receipts at the front door. I should mention that the industrial heater we have near the front door of the store is broken at the moment, so it was around 45 degrees Fahrenheit, 7 degrees Celsius, at the door all day. Barely warmer than the current temperature outside. I was bundled in three layers, a hat and gloves, to barely stay warm for five hours, so I wasn't in the best mood. Rude Lady and Rude Lady's friend come up to me from the cashier service desk with a receipt and a carriage with three items in it a case of water, and two bunches of bananas. They hand me a receipt, which clearly says non-member, where the membership number and info would usually be. This means they don't have a membership with the chain and aren't supposed to be shopping at all, but someone made an exception and let them purchase a few items. They hand me the receipt and I start to look it over. There's only one item on it, the water. So I ask very nicely, do you have another receipt? This actually happens quite a bit, People forget they did two separate transactions and only hand me one receipt. Also, if we suspect theft, which I never did throughout this entire exchange, we are required to ask if they have another receipt as a neutral way to start a conversation about a missed item. Rude lady. Nope. Why? Me. It looks like only your water was charged on this transaction, but not the bananas. 
rude lady, yelling out of nowhere. Well, I paid for them. Do you check everyone's receipt like this? Me. Yes, I do. I show her the receipt, trying to indicate that only the water is on there. Oh, so you count all the items in all the cards? Go ahead, ask the lady at customer service. She knows I paid. I page customer service to the front door. They're only about 20 feet away, so it doesn't take long. Customer service one comes over. Hi, can I help you? Rude lady's friend. Uh-uh, she didn't help us. That other girl did. Customer service two was with another customer at the moment, so she couldn't come over. I quickly explain the situation to customer service one, who relays the information to her colleague at the desk and awaits an answer. Customer service two. OP, she paid for those. She must have lost her receipt, but I did ring her up for them. Rude lady's friend. See? Rude lady. This is ridiculous. Do you really count everyone's card like this? Me. Yes. No, you don't. You know how I know? The guy in front of me had a full carriage of items, and you definitely didn't count all of them. At this point, I don't even know how to respond. Obviously, three items is a different situation than 50. When she had cut me off, I was actually about to explain how we are trained. If it's a small order, try to count everything. For larger orders, it's more common sense. Look for big items or items hidden underneath the carriage and verify a few smaller items in the carriage. The exception is large business orders, which we do have to check pretty much everything, no matter how long it takes, especially if tobacco is involved. Rude lady, glaring at me. You can give my receipt back now and help the next person. Me, starting to lose my patience. Ma'am, I'm just doing my job. Rude lady and her friend glare at me one last time and leave the store. Later, I found out from customer service too that rude lady had the receipt for the bananas on her. As in, it wasn't left at customer service when she checked out, but for some reason lied to me and said she didn't. She made a giant scene at the front of the store and backed up the line to get out for quite a while. Above all else, it's pretty simple. If I can clearly see that there are three items in front of me and the receipt only shows one, of course I'll ask. If I let her go without verifying, I could have been in huge trouble with the asset protection manager. I wasn't trying to accuse anyone of theft. Like I said, most of the time, mistakes like this are cashier error. Does it bother you when an employee stops you and asks to see your receipt? Please leave a comment letting me know. Next we've got, Entitled Father Tries to Kick Me Out of University. My freshman year, I was roommates with a guy who had fairly well-off parents. Let's call him John. John was a child actor, and although he isn't one you'd recognize immediately, he's played side characters on big sitcoms and did some voice acting on some pretty popular shows. His parents hold him to very high expectations and were very strict with him and his acting. So when he got into our university, which is considered a top 10 university globally, his parents held him to that same standard, which for a now liberated young adult with almost no maturity, he did the exact opposite of everything he should have done. He slept all day, partied all night, never studied, didn't go to class, etc. Yet, when his parents would call him to check up on him, I would always be mentioned in the conversations. They needed to make sure that I was a good influence on their son. They would consistently ask if I was partying often or bringing girls over. Pretty much everything he was doing. They wanted to ensure that I wasn't doing it to keep their son safe. This goes on for months. Whenever his parents would call him during his midday nap, and I'd be in between classes, I'd always hear him defending me to his parents, and he'd go beat red whenever I'd walk in and hear what they were saying about me over the phone. So I'd leave and wait until his call ended, since I knew he already felt embarrassed enough. I didn't really think of what they were saying either. I just thought it was ironic and told John afterwards that he didn't need to apologize since they weren't his thoughts. Around the end of the semester, John is told by his major department that he would likely flunk out of college if he did not ace the final exams in at least two of four of his classes, and that he would have to retake the other two regardless of how he did. Moreover, that he would lose a scholarship that paid a substantial amount of his tuition. He had to call his dad to tell him the bad news while I was on the top bunk of the bed studying, and his father is shouting so loud that I can hear him through John's phone with my earbuds in. Eventually, the question is asked if I had anything to do with John's bad grades, and before John can say anything, his dad determines that John was covering for me 
because I was a bad influence and that since I was around him all the time, I was the reason he failed. He demanded to speak to me and wanted me to tell him everything I did to his son and how I corrupted him. And when John said that I didn't do anything, it only made him angrier. And after telling me that I would pay, he hung up. He already knew my name and of course where I lived, but I didn't think he would do anything with that information until I got a call from the university's student affairs center telling me that John's father had requested access to my personal information through the student portal, basically a website with financial aid and enrollment info, and to change my passwords in case I thought that my data was at risk. I tell John that his dad tried to access my info and of course he called his dad to ask him what the heck he was doing. Dad said that because John was failing, he was pulling John out of college and that he was coming in a few days to talk to me about my part in all of this. John asks him again why he asked the school for my info and John's dad just hung up on him. I couldn't focus on all this at the time since I had my own exams to prep for. But as he said he would, he showed up as this fairly skinny, balding guy desperately trying to cover up his receding hairline by brushing up as much stringy blonde hair of his to the front of his head. I came down with the flu right before exams, so sadly I was forced to be in the room while John moved out, with his dad berating the both of us while I have my earbuds in and feel like I'm going to puke. John looks like he's going to cry because he doesn't want to leave and I peek over my laptop to see his dad putting books and notes in the garbage and repeatedly asking John if he officially withdrew from the university until John just barked yes at him. John's dad then turns to me and says something along the lines of, all right, now you. Again, I insist that I didn't do anything to John except live with him and the dad demanded that because I turned his kid from an accomplished actor to a college dropout, I should withdraw from the university too. John is now yelling at his dad to leave me alone and I'm telling him that there's no way I'm dropping out for his ego. He demands my laptop and portal login info and I tell him that if he even so much as touches my laptop or me, I'm calling the police. This escalates to a straight up shouting match among the three of us until the RA knocks on the door, warning us that if we don't quiet down, he will get campus security to come up and settle the issue. The dad quiets himself again and calmly asks me to withdraw again because it's only fair. I say no because again, I didn't do anything. There's a silence in the room as he approaches the edge of my bunk and he's glaring at me. I'm putting my earbuds in because chemistry won't study itself and he asks again, gripping the railing and almost hissing the question. I say no, again, didn't do anything. He finally decides that I'm not worth talking to anymore and says that he'll tell my parents everything I did and that they would make me leave college if he couldn't. And with that, he left with John. I got a text from my dad about a day later and that both he and my mom basically told him and his wife to buzz off and never contact me again in far more eloquent terms. I then got a barrage of emails and texts and Facebook posts from the parents pretty much saying that I was at fault for ruining their son's life and that I don't deserve that seat at my university. So I block them. Every now and then my parents would get Facebook messages or emails. They were ignored. John angry reacted my graduation pics on Facebook a few months ago. So out of paranoia that they were spying on me through his account, I blocked him too. I hope he understands. Next we've got, how many more times will I need to quit? A few years ago, I started a job with a temp agency. Unfortunately, I had five days of work over the space of five months at minimum wage. It doesn't take a genius to know this wasn't enough to get by. I found myself another job with guaranteed minimum hours a week. As soon as I got this new job, I quit the temp agency. About a month later, the temp agency calls me out of the blue and asks if I can do another shift. I tell them I already quit and they said they had no record of this, so I quit again. A few months later, I had another call from them and went through the same thing again. This time, I asked them to remove my contact details from their files. Over the space of 18 months, I had to quit about six times, asking for my contact info to be removed five times, and a friend decided to try and put a stop to the nuisance calls slash messages by emailing them the same thing. I also blocked their number. About three months ago, I received a call from a withheld number. I answer and, as you guessed it, it was the temp agency. 
The conversation goes as follows. Ni. Hello? Temp agent. Hello. Is this OP? Ni. It is. Who am I speaking to? Hi. This is Temp Agent from Temp Agency. Oh. Hi, Temp Agent. I believe I spoke to you last time. Yes. It's always me you speak to. We have a few shifts available. Do you want to take any? Me. As I told you last time. No. I quit. TA interrupts me. Oh, may I ask why not? As I was about to say, I already quit. Really? When? Why? As I tell you every time you call me, I quit over two years ago because I have another job. Can I speak to your superior? Sure. Can I ask why? Because I want to tell them the same as what I tell you every time. Take me off your calling list. Temp agent gets her boss and I explain the situation and tell her if I get one more call from them, I'll take legal action as they have emails telling them I quit and to no longer contact me dating back two years. The boss asked if I knew anyone else who was interested in a job with them as a replacement. The first person who came to mind is well knowledge when it comes to legal stuff surrounding things like this. I said, oh, I know someone. Oh wait, he quit too. You want his number to harass him? I know he won't tolerate it. Edit. Forgot a part in the last call. Also, I haven't heard from them since, but judging by how they've been these past few years, I'm guessing I'm due another call soon, and we'll keep this updated as and when I do. It's 10 a.m., and you won't sell me a McChicken because lunch starts at 11? I work at a pretty well-known fast food establishment, and we get all kinds of entitled people all the time. This was the most memorable. So at the place I work, we only sell breakfast items until 11. This lady pulls up to order at around 10.30. Me. Thank you for choosing Mick You Know The Place. What can I get for you? Karen. Yeah. Can I get a McChicken? Me. Sorry. Unfortunately, we don't start serving lunch until 11 today. Is there anything else I can get for you? Karen. Yeah. A McChicken. It's only 30 minutes. You can just make it for me. Me. I'm sorry, but I'm not allowed to sell any lunch items until 11 exactly. We do have breakfast items with chicken in it, if you'd like. Karen. See? You just told me you had chicken. Now make me the sandwich. Me. Unfortunately, I cannot do that. She then drives up to the last window and demands to speak to my manager. So I go get her so she can just tell her the exact same thing. Karen. This jerk won't let me have my McChicken, and I'm in a hurry, so if you could please... Manager. Excuse me, but we don't start lunch till 11, and I'm not going to pull out lunch items early just for you. So if you're not going to order, please pull through. Thank you. That's it. That's all she says and walks away. She never argues with customers, just tells them how it is. I then ask her if she'd like anything else, and she rolls her eyes. Yeah, I'm going to sit here till I get my food. So I tell my manager, and she's visibly irritated. She goes back to the window and tells her if she didn't move, she'd be forced to call the police. This is where things go south. You can't do that. I'm a paying customer. I have a right to be here. Get me my darn food. Now! My manager doesn't say anything, just walks away. She then begins honking and continues to yell. She grabs the phone and walks back to the window so the lady could see. She dials three random numbers and pretends to call the police. Karen. You're lying. You wouldn't do that to a paying customer. My manager ignores her and acts like they picked up the phone. Manager. Yes, there's a lady in the drive-thru and she's harassing my employees. And that was all it took for this lady to speed off. I will never get why people get so mad over food. Speaking of food, what's your favorite fast food place? Please leave a comment right now letting me know. Next we've got... Karen recognizes me from a job I stopped working at over a year ago. One day after work, I stopped by the local pet superstore where all the pets go in order to get some more litter for my two cats. This particular location has a station where you can refill your own jugs with the store brand litter at a discount if you buy one of their containers first. I have Maine Coon mixes, so I buy in bulk when I can and had three empty jugs in my cart and a fourth in my hand that I was refilling with litter. It's at this point that I hear a woman clear her throat. It was cold season, so a lot of people were doing that, and became vaguely aware of an older woman getting closer to me. I just moved closer to the bin so she could pass behind me if she needed to, 
finish up with the first jug and move on to the second. This was apparently the wrong thing to do, as the woman huffs at me. Where are the poop scoops? I stop what I'm doing and glance around, thinking that maybe she had spoken to an employee that was stocking shelves or something. But no, she's scowling right at me. It was early in the afternoon in the middle of the week, so there weren't many employees in the store yet. Whatever, no big deal. I have a vague idea of where things are since they remodeled the store. I take a second to glance down the aisle I'm standing next to and am relieved to see litter boxes. I reflexively give her a customer service smile and gesture down the aisle. They're at the end of this aisle, against the wall. Karen doesn't bother to thank me as she moves closer to the aisle and looks down it before huffing again. Those ones are too small. I need a big one. I realize at this point, she means the dog shovel scoop things. I shrug and move on to my third litter container. Well, I only have cats, so I don't know where the dog stuff is now that they remodeled the store. You should probably ask an employee. But you're an employee. I see you here all the time. I should probably point out that I work in an office and was dressed in black trousers, heels, and a green patterned blouse with a small purse hanging off the shoulder facing Karen. The employees here wear sneakers, jeans, and either a red or blue t-shirt with the company name and logo in big white letters on the front and back of the t-shirt. I have two large cats, so they go through litter pretty fast, so I'm here on an almost weekly basis, but I don't work here. That's a lie. You gave my dog a bath, and I've seen you on the registers. It's at this point I'm a little shocked. I had worked in the grooming salon of this particular store for a couple of months, but that was well over a year ago. I'm sorry, I should clarify, I haven't worked for this company in over a year. They've remodeled the store since I was an employee, so I really don't know where they moved the dog shovels to. I believe they were at the front of the store when I worked here, but that area is now where they have the dog food. I finally see an employee approaching, probably drawn to Karen's steadily rising voice, and point him out to Karen, who promptly stomps over to him to complain. I had finished refilling my jugs, so I pushed my cart towards the registers, only catching part of Karen's complaints about my poor customer service before I tuned the rest out. Funny thing is, I would have helped her find where it had been moved to if she hadn't started talking to me like I was beneath her. Just because you're old, it doesn't give you the right to toss basic manners to the dogs. Are you team dogs or team cats? Please leave a comment letting me know and we'll see who wins. Next we've got... Oh, your name's not Karen? Not my problem. So for background, I grew up in the hospitality industry with my parents, who, to those behind the scenes, shared the power of a general manager authority. Although my dad was the one who holds that position, has for over 10 years now. I'm talking a total power couple, even though, yes, they had and still have their arguments just like any other couple, with my dad handling the money, numbers, etc., essentially the business side, and my mother handling the social aspect or the employees slash guests. My mother is known widely throughout the hotel for no reason, or if you don't have a reason for not working, that I'm not taking your crap. You'd be surprised how often housekeepers just refuse to show up and work, but my father, on the other hand, is seen as the much more reasonable one, to a point at least. I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen him livid enough to the point of yelling where the hotel is concerned. Seeing as some of my earliest memories of the hotel rooms, front desks, and the general drama that happens behind the scenes, you'd think I'd be immune, or at least tolerant to crap, but that's another story for another day. As I said, I grew up in this business and helped out a lot taking shifts occasionally and running errands for whichever of my parents were on shift. But I never actually got paid the same as the other employees. By that, I mean my parents paid me from their own pay, which is fine. I hardly did the same amount of work they did in the same amount of time, which meant I wasn't on the payroll. Therefore, I wasn't technically an employee. Remember that, one of the few pieces that will come to play out in my favor. Okay. I also have to mention that my parents have managed more than one hotel in my lifetime, and for the past several years, the common thing is for them to live in the hotel they manage, given it's in a completely different state than their house. My house now, thank you. So they have their own room. I can access it when I'm visiting, because when I'm there, I pitch in and help out, which commonly requires me to have a master key. Yes, one that opens all the doors. 
They really don't look that much different from the guest keys, except for the markings or when the housekeepers wear them on lanyards and the regular guest keys don't work after noon, which is the time you must be checked out or you'll be charged for another day. One more piece to remember. There are five floors in total, but technically the second floor is where guests can use a side door to access the parking lot and their rooms without going all the way from the lobby. It requires an active key card to work from outside. Another piece. I don't tell anyone else this, and typically only a few staff members are aware of who I am anyways, the manager's daughter, so it's not really obvious. On my last visit, I was given a master key the day after I got there and was told they'd call me if they needed my help. I'm typically an introvert and stay in my room playing video games and reading, sometimes wandering out to spend time with my parents, wearing jeans and a graphic tank top and flannel, nothing like what the clerks or employees should wear. I left my room with a book in hand, my phone and master key in my pockets, but you could really only see the outline of my phone, another piece to come into play. This is where the background truly ends and the story begins. I was going to head down to the lobby with my book and sit on the couches to read, to hang out, when my mother on her shift, she's a bookworm too, so we tend to read in silence together, when as soon as my door closed, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I could feel a disturbance in the force. Lo and behold, from behind me I hear the sound of a wild Karen. Excuse me? My first thought was, oh boy. My second thought was, how fast can I annoy her? Yeah, I'm an introvert, but that doesn't mean I am uncomfortable with drama or people. I just prefer to hibernate in the comfort of my living space. Big difference. In fact, on occasion, when confronted with, well, confrontation, I find I enjoy myself when I annoy them. I mean, I didn't ask for you to bother me, so that's your problem. I digress. This lady is what I classify as your stereotypical Karen. Seems put together on the outside, but on the inside is just a storm of entitlement and lack of empathy. I won't describe what she looks like, because then people from the hotel would know exactly who she is. Anyways, I turned to face her, where I had just been about to step away from my room door, replying with, You're excused, which I know for a fact tends to take people off. But to be fair, it's what one is supposed to say at one's dinner table in response. Yeah, we're not at a dinner table, but still. You need to help me, right now. My third thought is, now where have I heard that one before? Oh right, this is Karen. No I don't, I'm just trying to go to the lobby. Oh no you're not, you're going to help me. Okay, this is where I realized that I had two major options. A. Get mad and lower myself to her level, or... B. Ride this out to the perfect, I don't work your lady moment. While option A was tempting, I decided that I could hold off on reading for now. Fine. What do you need help with? Well, you need to start doing your job and bring my bags out to my car. Whoa, hold up. The hotel employees do not do that. We weren't that big of a building or business to warrant bellboys, and we had luggage carts and elevators for that particular reason. As far as I know, Guests tended to understand that, until now. <laughs> Fine. You know what? I'll go along with it. So I head with Karen to her room, which was four doors down from mine, and she shoves this large suitcase, I'm talking everything but the kitchen sink large, into my hands and carries this tiny bag instead. The suitcase does have a handle, but when I reach for it, Karen snaps at me. No, I said to carry it out. No, you didn't. Karen gaped at me for a moment before replying with, Yes, I did. And do your job. And do not talk back to me. I'm a guest. So Karen is striding ahead of me by a few paces while I am somewhat struggling to carry this large suitcase. And by the time I get to the elevator, Karen is already standing beside it, where I set the bag down for a moment to catch my breath. Because that was pretty much my exercise for the week. Hurry up, or you're fired. Karen hops into the elevator, and by the time I'm able to pick up her suitcase, she's already heading down. So on the stairs, I simply push her suitcase down each flight, hoping that I'm already smashing a few breakables in the process. Yes, I was petty. Don't care. Karen is already out the side door by the time I reach the bottom with her suitcase. She didn't even notice that it had hit the bottom somewhat loudly. Before I pick it up, I check the time on my phone. 1.36pm. Karen was surely about to be charged for another day 
or had already been. She hadn't been out of her room long enough to have met the 12 noon deadline, obviously. Therefore, her card would not work. Ah, karma. You show up just when I need you. So I walk over to the door with her suitcase in hand and open it, nearly throwing it out the door, and Karen screeches when I do. You can't do that! I'm going to have your job for that, you useless jerk! So, not really mad, I stare at Karen, seeing her rage beginning to rise, when I don't start begging for forgiveness and simply say, You can't really take what I don't have to begin with. What? What do you mean? I take a small step back from the door, but I keep my body kind of leaned forward with my eyes locked on hers, so she doesn't notice the moment. I would have called her lady in this next part if she hadn't yelled at me and called me names and useless. I don't work here, Karen. Thanks for staying. I say in a falsely cheery voice before I slam the door shut with all my might. The electronic lock clicks into place, thus leaving her outside. Did I forget to mention that she still had things in her room? Well, yeah, she was charged for another day and even told my mother about the rude bellboy. I'm a girl and present as one, locking her out. My mother tried to explain to her that since she wasn't checked out or out of the room after 12, then she would be charged for another day and that her key card was only programmed for the night she had paid for. Oh, and that we don't have bellboys. Karen eventually got her stuff but still had to pay and didn't get her security deposit back since she had apparently damaged the doorframe to her room. All in all, bellboy one and wild Karen zero. Next we've got, boss blocks my promotion, I block his job. For background, I work in a very competitive part of the service industry. It's a large enough community, but at the same time, it's small enough where someone somewhere in the industry knows you, so it's important to not burn bridges as one day you may find yourself in a disadvantageous position. I was in my position for a good three years as middle management. No call outs, never late, always stayed after to help my team out worked on projects that belonged to my bosses, etc. Except for one day, which I had gotten in a car accident. I was working the night shift and it was raining, this is important later in the story, and was unable to go into work as my car was undrivable and I had to wait for a tow truck, insurance, and trying to find a ride late at night slash early morning was very difficult. At the time, my director had been let go and there was a battle to see who would get his promotion. For hierarchy purposes, it's my director, my direct bosses all on the same level of authority, three of them, then me. One of the direct bosses, let's call him Jerk, decided he was getting the promotion and started shaking our department, restructuring projects, changing people's shifts, taking credit for other people's work. He was a real pain. About a few weeks of this, he had decided to switch me from morning shifts, which I had gotten due to my seniority in the team, into night shifts. I didn't make a stink because we were very shorthanded also important, and the team needed help as we had newer members who had kids and I understood how this could affect their life. Fast forward a few more weeks and I get into the car accident which made me call out. This didn't sit well with him as I had made the team suffer because of my irresponsibility. What? And I didn't think much of it since I knew it was stressful and people tend to say things they don't mean under stress. Soon after that, I met some higher ups from another department. They offered me a job in a new venture the business was exploring. I was a good candidate because of my experience and work traits. Of course I agreed, as this would be a promotion in position and salary. Plus, my network of contacts would put me in a position to grow even further. I went through a series of interviews, three in total, and I was given the opportunity to take the position. I signed my paperwork and shook the hand. A couple of days later, HR called me saying the position was rescinded and that it shouldn't come as a surprise. I was shocked and asked for a meeting to understand the decision. Cue the day of the meeting. I walked in and HR is sitting in the meeting room with Jerk. After the cordialities, Jerk explains that he blocked my promotion because I had attendance issues, which I had one call out due to my accident. And HR chimed in saying this shouldn't deter me from applying again in six months. Okay. I accepted defeat because I still needed my job and I didn't want to paint a target on my back. A couple of days later, a friend of mine that worked close to Jerk had told me Jerk had made the comment that he didn't want to let me go because I would leave the night shift uncovered and no one would easily accept that shift. I was furious but decided to not act on it as I explained earlier it's a small enough business. 
A few months later, the competition opened up close enough that a few people left to go there. I was one of them. I was hired by an amazing boss who I am still friends with years after. He offered me a great position and a huge raise in salary. For hierarchy purposes, it was my boss, then me, and my counterpart, then our assistants. I had heard through the grapevine that Jerk had gotten rejected from the director position and was leaving the company. About a week or so later, I was looking at new hires with my boss to fill out my counterpart position. My boss calls me and says, Hey look, this guy comes from the company you came from. To my delight, I saw Jerk's name. I had been hiring people to the assistant positions from previous company, so I guess Jerk thought he was next. I told my boss the story about Jerk and how he blocked my promotion. All my boss said was, Thank you, but no thank you. We didn't even give him an interview. Looking back at it, we should have given him the interview and just said no. It would have made it sweeter. Like I said before, don't burn bridges if your industry is small. Next we've got, I want that $200 item for $50. While the topic of Karens is on my mind, I'll tell my biggest Karen story so far. The whole thing took place a few months ago when I was working an evening shift. While I'm on register, Karen comes up with a few items. This Karen is probably in her 50s, with dyed black hair and eyes that hate the world. I'm processing her items as she asks, Hey, do you think that piece of furniture out there will fit in my vehicle? It's that black one out there with the drawers. I drive an Arcadia. Now that's just so helpful. There's over a hundred pieces of furniture out there, and at least 20 are black, and more than one have drawers. It doesn't help that I had a pillar and other furniture obstructing my view and I cannot leave my register when I'm signed on, or when a transaction is in progress. So, not knowing the dimensions of the furniture, and not knowing what the heck an Arcadia is, I just decide to be safe, and say that I personally do not know if the piece would fit in her vehicle, and explain why. She's not happy with my answer, and she huffs. She sees one of my managers walk by and says, Oh, well he looks like he would know. I admittedly freeze, and repeat what I said. Yes, I know I messed up in that moment, but I don't feel nearly as bad, considering the rest of the story. I don't remember what form of payment she used for this transaction, but I'm fairly certain it wasn't a check. I leave my register to work on some other projects, since the lines are pretty non-existent in that moment, but I notice that Karen is still shopping at the front. Must have put her bags in the vehicle, and she's doing some more shopping. 20 minutes later, I get called up to the front for a furniture carryout, and sure enough, when I get up there, Karen is buying that piece of furniture with a check. I stand near the register, waiting and ensuring the payment of about $180 or so was actually given, and then I let Karen point me to which piece it was. It's, at most, a one and a half foot by five foot cabinet of drawers on wheels. Pretty small. I don't even need my two-wheeler, so I leave it behind. I ask Karen to pull her vehicle up to the doors, and I'll load the piece into her vehicle. She pulls out. I wheel the piece out, and as I'm lifting it up, she suddenly says, It's cracked! I pause and look closely. And yeah, it is. It's a thin, inch and a half long streak in the wood where it must have been warped or messed up somehow. Considering it has a blemish and her reaction, I set the piece down and ask, I take it you don't want it anymore? And she just says, Well, of course not! It's cracked! It's defective, it's broken, it shouldn't have even been on the floor in the first place. Do you guys not have any kind of quality control here? We head back inside to the register where she purchased the item. Now, policy states that we cannot do refunds for check purchases within 10 days of the purchase. This is done to allow the banks enough time to process the check. The cashier states this. Karen gets upset. The cashier calls for a manager. The assistant manager shows up. Karen is still upset. Assistant manager is still pretty new at the whole assistant manager thing, and so she calls the store manager up. This is where it gets fun. Karen's ranting about quality control and the blemish, and says she would only pay $50 for it at most. Remember, this piece was sold to her for $180, which is already a 30% discount of the original price. And she's saying a small scratch on the side of the piece justifies it being marked down that much. She says she wants it for $50, or she wants her check back. When she says this, the cashier and I just look wide-eyed at each other, silently saying, Is she serious? There's no way store manager is going to let that slide. And sure enough, he didn't. 
I was walking away to work on other stuff since I wasn't needed, but I still heard store manager being short with Karen, making a one-time exception and giving her check back after he saw her ID to ensure it was actually her. Apparently, she called the store the next day to complain some more, saying she waited 45 minutes before someone showed up to help get the furniture out to her car. Ha, <laughs> no. I was right there waiting for the transaction to complete. Store manager even confirmed that on the security cameras. And the best part? A different customer bought the same piece of furniture for the $180 later that week. Had no issues with it. Do people not have anything better to do with their lives? I pretended to be a manager to save a cashier. So, I'm 24, 22 at the time, and I worked as a station agent in a French airport. Those are the people in suit that check you and your luggage in and even board you or deboard you from planes. I worked with a French company for eight months during the summer of 2018. Working there was the best. Great hours, big pay. People are jerks, but honestly, not so bad once you learn how to deal with them properly. One of my favorite parts of this job were the hours, either from 4 a.m. to 2 p.m. or from 1 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. No weekends, nor public holidays. For most people, that's probably bad, but for me, it was paradise. We would get days off by cycle, and having days off in the middle of the week rocks. Go get groceries with almost nobody in stores, all government agencies open, and less people all around because they are working. A paradise. Now, for the five first months there, I would always come dressed in a suit, full suit, even in the middle of summer, with a tie and everything. So I would go home or stop to stores in the suit as well. After a while, I got tired and started to change clothes arriving and leaving from work. This story of course happened when I was still coming and leaving from work in a full suit. It was around three months after I started. By then, wearing a suit became neutral. No more of that weird, uncomfortable feeling while wearing it. It became normal. Even more, I got used to changing my attitude while wearing it like my posture and people, even in the streets, would think that I am some successful person just because I wear a suit. And I also got quite used to noticing people needing help, problematic customers and all that. I leave work at 3 or 4 p.m., had to stay longer to cover for someone, and head to a store to bring a faulty electronic I bought there. I walk to the store, wearing only my suit, and carrying the thing in a bag. I head toward customer service and immediately notice a man, hand on the counter, leaning toward the cashier. She'll be Julie, and all her colleagues look tense, eyeing the guy. I shrug, not my problem. I'm not paid to deal with that one. I turn to sit and notice that all the seats are taken, so I stay up and pull out my phone. Meanwhile, this guy starts to speak louder and louder. From what I got, the issue was that he wanted to use the store card of his wife, but the store policy is that you can't use the card of another customer, even if you're their relative, as the card can be used to make credit. The guy gets more and more heated up and starts calling around for other people to join. That immediately ticks me off. When I was in training to become a station agent, we learned of different types of customers. I won't go into detail, but this guy is what we call a red customer someone that will rally others to help them get what they want. I see Julie on the verge of tears and I try to think of something to do while the guy starts yelling at her. I finally notice a paper hanging near the counter and take action. I drop my bag, adjust my tie, take my best manager face and walk over to the guy. As soon as he notices me, he smirks and turns to me. You're the manager? To which I reply, yes, while looking at both him and the cashier. As if to judge the situation, Julie turns white. He points at her and says, This employee is discriminating against me. I want to use a discount on my wife's store card. I have her ID. There's no reason that... I then take a step forward. I'm not tall, and this guy is taller than me. But he still stops while I get into his face. Without a word, I point at the paper I saw earlier. It's a notice saying that any kind of harassment or insults towards an employee will result in a lawsuit and fine for the customer. It's his time to turn white, or whiter. He opens his mouth, but I'm faster. She is right. If you want to use that card, you need your wife to be here. Now I have to ask you to leave, or I'll have to call security. But first, you will apologize. You've been beyond insulting to her. A security guard that is always near steps closer. He turns to the woman, apologizes in a weak voice, and quickly walks off. I walk to Julie and ask if she's okay. 
She thanks me profusely. Then another worker comes to me and asks me what to do with a product returned by another client. I giggle and pulling my airport ID simply state, sorry, I don't work here. I just can't stand people like this. I was allowed to pass first, got a refund and smiles from everyone on the team. A good day. Would you ever pretend to be a manager to help out a cashier in need? Please let me know in the comments. Next we've got Entitled Mom Wants to Delete a Zombie Game from My Phone. Cast. We've got me. We've got Entitled Mom. We've got Nice Kid. We've got my mom and my dad, the one who arrested the Entitled Mom. Background. So me, my mom and siblings went to New Orleans to visit family for Thanksgiving. So we land at the second airport with no problem and we had like a three hour layover time. So we found the gate we were at, which took 30 minutes. So my mom went to go get food with my siblings and left me with the stuff. So I did what any normal person would do and just chilled and played a game on my phone. I was playing last day on earth, so I will look back for my mom and she wasn't there. But nice kid was there watching. He's about my age, which is 15. Me jumps a bit. Oh, hey, nice kid. Hey, sorry I can't help, but notice the game on your phone. What's it about? Me. Well, it's about the zombies. Oh, cool. So I keep playing and telling Nice Kid about it, but I guess when I started taking out the zombies, I hear this. Entitled Mom. <gasps> what is that awful game? Me. What do you mean, lady? That game that you're playing. Oh, what's wrong with it? It has blood in it. So what? That game made you violent and it will do the same thing to my son. Now hand over the phone so I can delete that horrible game. Nice kid. Mom, please don't do this again. Entitled Mom. It's for your own good, sweetie. Me. Wait, she's done this before? Nice kid. Yeah. That's none of your business. Now hand over the phone. Me. No, it's my property. Entitled Mom, now shouting. You need to respect your elders, young man. Now my mom has come back. My mom. He does respect his elders. How would you know this? Because he's my son. Fast forward an hour and 30 minutes later. It's time to board and fate would have it I got sat next to the entitled mom and nice kid. Now I have ADHD, which is where I can't sit still for long periods of time. So I start bouncing my leg. Nice kid. ADHD I'm guessing? Me. Yeah. Entitled mom. Shut up you two. I'm trying to get my sleep. So Nice Kid's mom fell asleep and Nice Kid starts telling me that his mom thinks these kinds of games make people violent. Nice Kid. The reason why she did that is because she thought it would make me violent. Me. Oh, but why were you watching? You're about my age. Nice Kid. My mom forbids my phone or anything at her house. That's why I'm hoping my dad gets full custody of me. My dad likes the same stuff I do, so I just leave my stuff at his place. Me. Oh man, I'm sorry your mom's like that. Thanks, man. So I had fallen asleep at this point and I woke up to nice kid holding my phone with his mom telling him to give it. Me. What's this about? Nice kid. She tried taking your phone. Me. Oh, thanks for grabbing it. Now we had landed and into the airport. Now my dad had picked up an extra duty shift and he had some free time. So he came to see us when we landed. That's when Karen gets off the plane and she slapped me and pushed me to the ground. That's for not giving me the phone. Thud. Entitled mom. I'll have your badge for this. My dad. You just assaulted someone. I'm in full legal rights to do this. Me. Explains what's happened. She tried to take my phone, dad. Entitled mom. Complete jerk face. Wait. Dad? My dad. That's right. Now explains the court of law talk. As for me and the kid, we're now good friends. We go to the same high school and his dad won full custody of him after this incident. So for entitled mom, she got a month in jail and community service hours. I hope you all enjoyed reading previous and new. What games do you play on your phone? Please let me know right now in the comments. Next we've got Actor's mom angry that the box office is not open 45 minutes early. So when I was in college, I worked at my school's theater as a seamstress. Another former grad and I decided to go to homecoming, which also had a play in the theater scheduled after the game. So we decided to stay and say hi to those that were still there, as well as see the show. We had a long time to wait, 
so we decided just to chill in the lobby for a couple of hours, waiting till the play started. About 45 minutes before box office even opened, the entitled mother came in. Cast of characters is me. We've got my theater friend. We've got entitled mother, and B is my former boss and one of the faculty that runs the theater. Another note is that Entitled Mom has a super high-pitched voice. Think a girl version of Alvin and the Chipmunks. Entitled Mom walks into the lobby and notices that the box office is obviously closed, then walks over to us, just laying on the couches relaxing. Entitled Mom. Excuse me, but when does the box office open? Friend. As the sign states, it does not open for another 45 minutes. If you're looking for information, we might be able to help. What do you need? We used to work for the theater when we were students. Entitled Mom. I just came to get my tickets I reserved over the phone, but the person refused to confirm whether I got the seats I wanted. Friend. Well, sometimes reservations take a while to go into the system, so they probably had to wait and check that it was not already reserved and the system just had not updated yet. Well, I wanted those seats and I better have gotten those seats. Me. Well, due to the small size of our theater, all our seats have just as good of a view. So, even if you did not get those specific seats, they will still be just as good. The box office still is not open, so you can either wait or come back later to check and see. Entitled Mom starts getting pretty heated at this. Well, I can't wait. I need to see it now, because I am going to a restaurant now, and I do not want to lose out on my seats because they did not do their job right friend. Well, we could maybe try and find boss in the back. The box office is still not open, but maybe she can confirm your reservation. Entitled mom, pleased with this, agrees and waits with me in the lobby. Boss shows up and talks with Entitled Mom and decides to save herself the headache and goes back to grab Entitled Mom's tickets. Entitled Mom leaves and we all laugh at the situation, thinking it was over. We were very wrong. Entitled Mom comes storming in, maybe 15 minutes later, and the box office is still closed. Entitled Mom, an angry, even higher-pitched voice than before. These are not the seats I had asked for. Where is boss? I want the tickets I had reserved. Me. I'm sorry. Might have just been a simple mistake. Boss is busy getting the show ready right now, and you can get it fixed when the box office opens. Entitled Mom. Well, I can't wait for it to open. I still need to go to dinner. I wanted to get them early because I knew it would be full. If this continues, I will just come back and buy the tickets with the right seats. Friend. Well, here, let me see your tickets. I used to work house, and I can tell you where these will be. Ah, these seats are really good seats. Almost up front and in the middle. I don't want to be up front. That is not the seats I wanted. This needs to be fixed. Me. Well, box office still is not open, and people are getting everything ready for the performance, so you will just have to wait. Entitled Mom gets even angrier, makes a groaning sound, and stomps her feet like a kid, then storms out. Friend decided to go find Boss again to warn her about what was coming down the line. Boss quickly went into the box office, found out she just accidentally grabbed the name behind hers for tickets, and rushed out the door to see if she could catch the Entitled Mom. Entitled Mom was storming back right at that moment with her husband in tow, probably to try to use him to intimidate us into giving her different seats. Despite the fact that we don't even work there, Boss meets up with them and in her amazingly passive-aggressive, sarcastic voice says, Here is your free tickets. We are so sorry for the inconvenience. It would have been much easier if the box office was actually open. For actors and staff, we get two tickets for free for each show, so this entitled mom was putting up all this fuss over tickets she did not even pay for. Entitled mom is obviously not happy with her tone, but seems a bit put in her place. Boss brings us back into her office, where we all start laughing. She then gives us cake as an apology for having to deal with that when we were just trying to enjoy our visit. She then said that she would personally seat entitled mom when she came back for the show. The best part of this whole experience was when we saw Entitled Mom come in and sit down. Her reserved seats were all of four seats to the right of the mixed up ones in the same row. So her whole complaint about not wanting the front row was one, incorrect in the first place, and two, the exact same row she wanted to be in. 
She was also almost late for the show and came in right before they closed the doors. Next we've got Bus Boy Caught Taking People's Tips Fired That Night. Backstory. My wife and I had our favorite restaurant that we frequented a lot at least once a week. So we got to know everyone working there pretty well and became close friends with a few of the servers and the manager. One of our friends was working that night and approached us to help him out. He said he got complaints from a couple of servers about tips completely missing, like a $0 tip on a $100 bill from regulars that always tip. He was suspecting that it was the busboy doing it, but had no proof. We were sitting across from a table that was just finishing up, so our friend waited until they were gone and replaced the tip with like $10 to $15 of his own, the actual tip was much larger, and left the check holder on the table. He then asked us to just keep an eye on the table when the busboy came by and report back to him. Well, as we watched, he cleared the table, put the check holder in his apron, and disappeared around the corner to a hidden section of the restaurant and returned a minute later to replace the holder to the now clean table. Our friend came by, and as suspected, the holder was empty. We then relayed what we saw, busboy taking the holder, disappearing, etc. I remember seeing him slump visibly and walk off like he knew the truth but didn't want it to be so. We talked later with our friend and he along with the manager confronted the busboy on what happened and gave him the chance to confess and be fired with no further actions taken. He owned up to it and was escorted out. Everyone working there was kind of bummed even despite getting their tips stolen because it was a small family owned type place and the owner had taken a chance on hiring the kid. Everyone really liked him and he had had some troubles earlier on in life and was just trying to turn things around. He was only like 18 or 19 at the time, but couldn't seem to get out of his own way. I had two reactions to this. The first was the complete r slash unethical life pro tips route of why in the world are you taking the whole tip? Skim a few bucks here and there. You may not get caught, at least for a while, but you take the whole dang tip? The second was that the parent in me wanted to pull him aside and just try to get through. They took a chance on hiring you and you pull this crap? This isn't rock bottom, but you are heading there quick if you don't shape up. Next we've got Entitled Family Buys Their First Fish Tank So I've taken up fish keeping as a hobby and let me just tell you, those little guys are a lot of work. I'm in my local pet shop at least once every other week, to the point that they've gotten to know me pretty well. It's a chain store, but the staff at this place is really excellent and I cannot heap enough praise upon them. They do a really good job of making sure to have at least one decently knowledgeable person there working in every section. Anyway, the other day I popped in to grab some fish food and since I had room, maybe a couple of fish if they had anything interesting. It was semi busy and the fish section guy was busy helping a family of two parents and one very rambunctious girl who was running back and forth through the fish aisle. Every once in a while, the girl stopped to stare at one of the tanks and points out a fish she liked. Mommy's cooing, wow, without looking up from the phone. Meanwhile, dad came back over with a 15 gallon tank, which is relatively small for a tank, and basically all of the equipment, decorations, you name it. Everything you'd need to get started. Okay, sweetie, he said, ready to pick out some fishies? This stopped the fish guy in his tracks. Uh, are those fish for that tank you're buying? Dad enthusiastically replied, Yep, it's our first fish tank. Okay, so I wouldn't expect this to be universal knowledge, but it is important to know if you plan on getting fish. It's a really bad idea to set up a fish tank and put the fish in on the same day. It's even worse if you put many fish in it simultaneously, because you need to give the tank time to settle first. Depending on the source, the water may have to be treated, as most species of fish are somewhat particular in the water conditions they can handle, and if you were including things like life plans, you need to give them time to make the changes to the water that they inevitably make. Otherwise, the stress and shock from unsuitable conditions or a rapid change in water quality can hurt the fish quite quickly. For a more scientific explanation of all this, look up aquarium cycling. Anyway, the fish guy politely explained this to the family and said that it's typically the store policy to not sell fish and a tank to customers on the same day. The tank should take about a week or two to cycle, and if there are any fish that they really want, they can buy them in advance and the store will hold them in a special tank until they're ready to be picked up. The little girl piped up with, Daddy, when can I get my fishy? And this guy went straight to, 
I'm sorry, sweetheart. This man is saying you can't have a fishy right now. Immediately, this girl ran about six feet back, slammed her back up against the fish tanks, slid to the door, and started sobbing. Mommy rushed to the girl and immediately started with, Don't worry, daddy will get your fishy. Fish guy didn't really know how to handle this at this point, but lucky him that the manager was just happening to walk by. Is everything okay here? He asked. Dad replied with, Yeah, this guy won't sell us a fish. The manager then asked, Is it for that tank you're holding, sir? Dad said, Yes. And the manager began to give him the same exact explanation as the fish guy before. Dad cut in with, Yeah, I heard that spiel. Don't care. The manager was trying to reiterate why it is such a bad idea to do this, and the dad finally said, Like I said, I don't care. You see that girl right there? I am more than happy to let that go on all day until you sell me some fish. The manager sighed, looked at the fish guy and said, just give him the dang fish, and walked away for what I can only imagine was the most important cigarette of the day. The dad stood there looking all smug and announced, okay, sweetie, you can get your fish. And it was like a switch got flicked and the girl stopped immediately, like she had never had a tantrum in her life. As if it were not enough for them to get their way, this family proceeded to pick out a fish from virtually every tank. I wish I were joking. Without thinking twice, these people put together an abomination of a tank. You see, there are many kinds of fish. Some are big, some are small, some are solitary, and some hang out in groups. Some like to nibble on store-bought flakes, and some delight in tearing the next nearest fish into fresh flakes. These are the things you must consider when stocking a tank with fish. These people did not consider that, remotely. I'm talking like single specimens of fish that should be in a group. Some larger fish like goldfish, which honestly need like 10 gallons apiece. Some catfish that are almost certainly not going to eat flakes from the surface. Basically, a whole bunch of fish that should not be together and not crammed into 15 gallons of water. But friends, there is at least some assurance that these people will have a learning experience. You see, the very last fish they grabbed was what the father called the biggest goldfish I've ever seen. Fish guy tried to explain, but by that point they had completely tuned him out. Look, his name is Oscar, like Oscar the Grouch. Heh, <laughs> Grouch, that's putting it lightly. Because you see, Oscar was not a goldfish. Oscar was an Oscar, a type of cichlid. They are territorial as heck, and this guy was destined for a 15 gallon tank of many much smaller fish. So they went off to pay. They left a decent number of zebrafish, so I ended up asking for those. I told the guy, and don't worry, my tank cycled and is well established. He just put his head down and said, those idiots. I replied, I feel bad for the fish though. He said that when they inevitably come back for a refund, they'll have a hard time with it when the receipt shows both the tank and the fish. Anyway, if Oscar survived the water conditions, I'm sure they're having a National Geographic moment right now. I'll try to remember to follow up if the same guy is working next time I go in. He's there frequently, so am I. I should probably learn his name. I'm bad with that kind of stuff. Next we've got, none of us work here, lady. So back in 2009, the company I had been working for went out of business, yet another victim of the credit crunch. And after about six months of unemployment, I was starting to get a little depressed. So my mom suggested that I should do some voluntary work just to give me something to do. After checking with the job center that it wouldn't affect my unemployment benefits, I went to the local branch of a national charity to see if they needed anyone. They did, and I soon became part of the small team that ran that particular location. Everyone there was a volunteer, mostly older, retired people. So being in my mid-twenties at the time, I was given most of the physical work, which suited me fine as I'm not too good at paperwork. Now I should explain that the charity rents out equipment for elderly and disabled people charging just enough to keep us running and providing a little extra for any unexpected costs that might pop up. The only paid employee we had was a manager who worked out of a different branch in another town, maybe an hour away. Our branch was located in a small building adjacent to a pay and display car park in the center of town with about seven dedicated, clearly marked parking bays. Given our location, it wasn't unusual for people to come in asking questions about the car park and we all quickly became used to it. Sometimes we'd get people angry about getting a ticket, but they usually calmed down when we explained that it wasn't anything to do with us. Now that I've set the scene, on to our story. 
It's been 10 years, so I'm going by memory. Cast. We've got me. We've got team leader. We've got volunteer and entitled lady. It was a pretty normal day. Must have been a Tuesday, given who was on, and I was down one end of the single large room that made up the bulk of the building, doing some housekeeping when an older woman, I'd say mid to late 60s, walked in. I only looked around to see if I was needed to get anything, but kept out of it. Little did I know that I was about to experience what I now know to be a Karen in the wild. Volunteer. Hello, how can we help you? Entitled lady. Yes, I've parked in one of the disabled bays next to the building here. Volunteer. Oh, and have you used us before? No, I'm just taking my husband to the dentist. This was across the road that ran down one side of the car park. Volunteer. Oh, I'm sorry, but those bays are reserved for people using our scheme. Entitled lady cutting her off. My husband has a blue badge. For those who don't know, a blue badge is a government-issued disabled parking permit that's recognized almost everywhere in the UK. Volunteer. I see, but those bays aren't part of the actual car park. Entitled lady. It's a blue badge. We can park anywhere. Note. No, you can't. There are still restrictions on their usage, but not everyone reads the booklet that comes with it. At this point, our team leader stepped out of her office by the door. Team leader. I'm sorry, but those are private bays. We rent them separately from the landowner. But my husband has a blue badge. Yes, but they're private parking bays. You obviously don't understand how these things work. Team leader, leaning forward on the crutches she needed to get around. Really? Now, I'm still friends with team leader, and while she's a friendly, outgoing person, I've seen her when she blows her lid and decided that it would be a good idea if I stepped in at this point. Me. Private parking spaces aren't necessarily covered by the blue badge scheme. Entitled lady simply glares at me as if I was beneath her notice, so I go back to what I'd been doing. I didn't pay much attention to the rest of the conversation, but eventually entitled lady stormed off in a huff and moved her car. Not long after, one of the volunteers, I forget who, was outside and saw her having parked on the road directly outside the dentist talking to a traffic warden. Note, the car park was private property and was overseen by a private company, so a council-employed traffic warden had no say over anything that happened there. No matter how excitedly Entitled Lady gestured towards our office, we assumed that that was the end of it. But would I really be posting this here if that was the case? No, no I wouldn't. Entitled Lady comes back in, demanding to speak to our manager. Team leader is behind the desk at this point and informs her that she is indeed the team leader, even holding up her laminated name badge that clearly stated as much. Entitled Lady scoffs at this and repeats that she wants to speak to the manager now. Team Leader explains that the manager is based out of main office in the other town, but dutifully produces a letterhead with the phone number and address, even writes on it the manager's full name. Entitled Lady, grabbing the piece of paper, I'll have you all fired for this. Team Leader, Volunteer, and me, laughing to various degrees. We're all volunteers here. None of us are actually employed by the charity. Entitled Lady gives a <laughs> that would put an enraged elephant to shame, spins on her heels, and storms off again. Well, we laugh about it, but put it out of mind, as we have better things to think about. Then, about two weeks later, one of the trustees for the charity pops in, and we learn what happened next. Entitled Lady called the main office and spent an hour on the phone with the manager, not realizing that team leader had already emailed her an account of what had happened. The manager tries to explain to Entitled Lady that, no, we had actually been in the right, and yes, she would have gotten a ticket if she had parked in one of our bays. Entitled Lady was having none of it and informed the manager that she'd be taking it to her superiors. A few days later, a letter had arrived addressed to the managing director of the charity, the name of the return address evidently being the same that Entitled Lady had given. Well, charities don't have managing directors, and as no one in the office felt like getting involved with that particular brand of crazy, the story having gotten around to everyone the unopened letter was stuck to the notice board with a thumbtack. To the best of my knowledge, it remains there to this day. I have since found the job, but I still pop into the charity with tea, coffee, and biscuits from time to time. But I always look in the window first to check for Karens. Karen complains about prices and ruins a great deal for herself. This story took place over the course of a few weeks. Bear with me as I recall the details. I work at a thrift shop. Most items are priced based on quality and condition, however, we do have set prices for some items. One such item is Monster High Dolls. We get them pretty often, 
So the general rule is that each doll goes out for $5. If it's in bad shape or missing bits, it's $4. And if it's clothed with accessories, it's $6. It's always been this way, and this is a standard across all of our locations. I've had customers ask why these dolls are more expensive than our Barbies or other dolls out there, and I usually explain that Monster High dolls offer articulated joints and are popular for customizing and sculpting off of. When we get into a conversation about it, usually the customer will understand why the dolls are on the pricier side. Well, not this lady. This lady brought up about 10 dolls to the register and immediately asked my cashier for a manager, myself. She asks why the dolls are expensive. I explain why and assume she'll understand, but no. She instead insists that the other stores sell these dolls for $3 and she even found one in the package with all these extra accessories for only $8. I told her that unfortunately without some proof, I wouldn't be able to honor such a reduced price, but did offer her $5 for a couple of her $6 picks due to minor imperfections. That was two or so weeks ago, and I assumed that that was the end of it, but I was wrong. This lady came back about a week ago and told me she was so glad she could catch me again because she has something to show me. I got a little excited because I thought she was going to show me her collection or a doll she had customized. She brought all my expectations down when I saw she was showing me pictures of Monster High dolls from other locations. Sure enough, priced at $3 across the board. I was so surprised, I just stared. She put on a smug face and told me, See? Your dolls are maybe just a little overpriced. And with how snotty her voice was, it took everything in me to be civil when I told her that I would speak to the store manager to clarify whether our prices were right or the other location's prices. She walked away thinking she had won, and I walked away kind of defeated. The next day when I saw the store manager was in, I asked him if we had a set price for Monster High dolls. He told me yes, and together we reviewed the pricing standard for dolls. We even went out onto the sales floor to make sure we really were on track with our pricing. Seeing as we have never had to recycle a single Monster High doll for not selling, we decided we did not need to lower the prices. Now, just today, the store manager approached me when I started my shift, grinning ear to ear. He had a story to tell me. Apparently, this lady had gone to the other locations within our city and complained and moaned about our horribly overpriced dolls to the cashier who brought the manager over to share the conversation. She told them they should talk to that other store and see about lowering our prices a notch. And so the manager did what any good manager ought to do. She followed up and reviewed the pricing standard for these toys and dolls. To her horror, she saw that their store was in the wrong. They were practically giving these dolls away and the pricing standard wasn't even posted at the tables, so the pricers had no idea they were pricing things incorrectly. She emailed our store manager immediately with her findings and asked us for our thoughts. My store manager told her that he and his team had encountered the lady as well and recommended reviewing the standards with her team so that they could price correctly. Then he cc'd the email to the district manager who later in the night rolled out an email about following pricing standards more thoroughly across all departments to prevent customers like her from trying to undermine us like that again. So basically, this lady completely destroyed a really good deal for herself by raising a stink about the overpriced dolls at the other store. She's gonna be in for a nasty surprise when she next visits and finds all the dolls are appropriately priced. So much for her doll collection. Speaking of collections, do you have anything that you collect? If so, please let me know what it is in the comments. Next we've got update on the entitled family who bought their first fish tank. Well, 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 lucky you and unlucky me. Because I came home from work this afternoon and tested my tank water to find I have a nasty little ammonia spike going on. Probably has to do with the snail food I recently discovered one of my minnows stockpiling inside a barnacle. Nothing but drama, these fish. Anyway, that meant I had to pop off to the shop for some bacterial cultures. These things help in this situation, consult Google for science. And of course, I had my fingers crossed fish guy was working. Well, what do you know? I guess today's not so unlucky after all. Usually in this store, I spend a minute or two milling around and browsing before I actually get to the meat of my shopping. 
but today I walked straight up to him. Didn't just launch into it though. I let him know my problem and asked him what he would recommend, kind of already half knowing what I was going to get. Then I just casually slipped in. You know, it's probably karma. I was in here on Sunday judging this family so hard for insisting they fill an uncycled tank with random fish and now that's about as far as I got before he started wildly cackling. He composed himself, apologized and said, oh, you watched that one go down? I said yes and that I wondered how it was going for that guy. Fish guy then gave me the skinny on everything as apparently I missed some stuff. Fish guy is good people. So according to Fish Guy, everything with this family started basically normal. Family comes in, girl is getting a fish as a reward for something. Fish Guy couldn't remember but said it was something stupid. Fish Guy shows them around the fish section and the whole time the dad keeps saying that he's always been a fish person and a few times mentions fishing from the boat. The next town over is super affluent, lots of families with a spot at the marina. This is why Fish Guy let them get as far as they did before bringing up cycling. He thought they knew and were taking it into account. The first thing they grabbed was the tank. After that, they start making a beeline for the live fish and Fish Guy says, Hey, wait, you might want a filter, heater, tank cover, etc. Dad says those aren't necessary. This is Fish Guy's first inclination something is up. Fish Guy is trying to stress the importance of having the equipment and Dad is brushing it off like it's just an upsell. We'll clean it ourselves. We keep our house warm, etc. Finally, Fish Guy convinces Dad to, at the very least, get a filter and a net because I guess by this point he knew. Dad goes off to grab a bunch of plastic plants and gravel, comes back and everything after that is the scene I witnessed. So, I know what you're all wondering. What the heck happened to Oscar? Well folks, I've got your answer and it ain't nice. Disclaimer, the following is a second-hand account of a second-hand account. Fish Guy didn't see this go down, but it was all reiterated to him by the manager, the same one who told Fish Guy to just make the sale. Yesterday, which was Tuesday as of writing this, Dad came back with an empty tank and the filter. He told the associate at the register he wanted to do a return. Associate said okay and asked if the stuff had been used. Dad said no. Associate looked at the stuff and saw that the tank hadn't been cleaned very well and that the filter was badly repackaged. Associate then asked if Dad had a receipt. Dad produced the receipt and said he'd like a refund for the full amount of the receipt. Associate saw that the receipt had live fish on it, in addition to all the other stuff he hadn't brought back, and told him that she couldn't accept the return as the stuff had clearly been used and as per store policy, they cannot accept returns of used goods unless they are defective or recalled or something. So of course, Dad asked for the manager. Now apparently the manager felt really bad after the fact about making the sale. According to Fish Guy, manager lost his mother on Saturday and he had to report to work on Sunday morning, not his best day. He just wanted to make it stop and apparently afterward was dreading them coming back because he knew they would, because someone would have to deal with it and it would invariably be worse. Anyway, no sooner did the manager get to the front end when dad starts chewing him out about traumatizing his daughter. That mutant goldfish! You didn't give us enough water! Y'all, these idiots thought the water included in the fish bags was enough to fill their tank. Now, granted, they got a lot of fish from a lot of tanks, so I would imagine after including all the gravel and decorations, maybe they were able to get that tank like one third of the way full. So I guess I could see how a complete idiot could maybe do the mental gymnastics to make that assumption. But still, really? Anyway, from what I'm told, Oscar went in last and apparently it wasn't like two minutes until the carnage began. I'm told the daughter witnessed it and freaked out. Dad scooped out Oscar and flushed him alive. So of course now they were left with a mostly not full tank of some living, some dead and some maimed fish. Dad got the bright idea that it was the pet store's fault the fish got eaten because they didn't give them enough water. What did he do? If you guessed filling the rest of the tank with icy cold tap water, you're a winner. I'm told the defective, as Dad put it, fish started going belly up with a quickness and so Dad got fed up and dumped the lot of them. Told his daughter they would try a different pet. Anyway, 
Dad finished ranting all of this at Manager like it was going to win him points, and Manager basically told him, Well, we warned you, we will not refund you, and we suggest you take your business elsewhere. Dad threatened to get in touch with corporate, and Manager's response was along the lines of, If anything, they'll be mad I sold you the fish in the first place. Dad stormed out and left the stuff. So yeah, there's the scoop. Wanted to get that up while the details were still fresh in my memory. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got something like 20 gallons of water to swap around. Next we've got, Stop lying, I want her fired. A little background. I work in a retail store inside a shopping mall and we are required to wear all black. Our store doesn't have a washroom, but a larger store down the hall does have a public washroom, which is closer to me than any others so I usually just head down there when I gotta go. Now, the employees at this store also wear all black, but they have name tags with the company logo that they all wear on their shirt. I'm usually wearing a lanyard with my company name on it that I take off when leaving the store. On this particular day though, I left it on. It isn't uncommon for myself and my coworkers to be mistaken for employees at this store, and we have customers ask us if we are working or if we could help them with something. But once we say that we actually don't work there, everyone has an awkward chuckle and moves on with their day. That is not what happened with this Entitled Karen. So anyways, I'm walking through the store towards the washroom when Entitled Karen huffs and pulls herself off the mattress she was testing. She looked around with her arms crossed and you could see her eyes narrow as she saw me walking towards her direction. Excuse me? I knew she was wanting a question answered so I just put my hands up and said, I'm sorry, I don't work here. She looked me up and down. You obviously do. Look, I was just wondering. No, ma'am, I'm sorry, but I don't work here. I showed her my company's logo and told her where I worked, down at another store. Okay, well, you work at the mall, so you can still help me. I need this, but wanted to talk about financing. I'm in a hurry and just want to get this done. Me. I really can't help you with that. I'm just trying to use the washroom and get back to my work. Don't you dare lie to me. I told you I'm in a hurry. And I told you I don't work here. There's a service desk down that way you can try. She was fuming and her face was going red. A few people had walked by, but no employees. So I tried to just walk away, but she stepped out in front of me. You are going to help me with this and then you can go do whatever you want, okay? me. No, I'm sorry, but I have to go. I turned around to head back to my store and shake off this crazy lady when an actual store employee headed over. Ugh, maybe you can help me. I want her fired. Employee. Uh, she doesn't work for us. Stop lying. I want the manager. Employee. Okay, if you'll just follow me. And she is coming too. Points to me. Me. No. I'm just going to the washroom and heading back to work. No, you are coming to speak to the manager about how to better serve your customers. I just shook my head and walked off, which sent her into a screaming fit. She was yelling at the employee and any customers who walked by, then eventually stormed off in another direction. Nothing ever came of this. I still laugh with my coworkers about this whenever we almost forget to leave our lanyards. Next we've got... He was a public health risk, so I got him promoted to customer. Years back, I worked in the back of house for a chain of fast casual restaurants. Let's call it Emerald Wednesday. I had been there for quite some time and had seen many managers, both good and bad, come and go. They typically lasted just a couple of years. We had been gifted a general manager who was sent to our store as his last chance to salvage his career and when he failed, we were without a general manager for a couple of months. The assistant managers ran the restaurant and things were okay, but no one was getting promoted within the company. Then the district manager went with an outside hire that was coming in from the other side of the country. This guy was a complete idiot. We'll call him Johnny. He had zero experience as a general manager and wasn't even applying for the position, but the district manager talked him into taking the job. Big mistake. Under Johnny's tutelage, our Emerald Wednesday started to slowly fail, mostly due to his mismanagement. He was belligerent to the staff, making a couple of the girls cry by belittling them in front of everyone else. 
He was so lazy, he'd hide in the office on busy weekends while we struggled without a manager. He refused to do even the basics of his job, like the nightly pole thaw. For those who don't know, many things are kept frozen in the walk-in freezer and are pulled forward to the cooler at night so that they thaw before morning. This was rarely done on Johnny's evening shifts. We would routinely have to force thaw steaks, shrimp, and chicken under running cold water, which is not something that we're supposed to even do. I saw on a few occasions that Johnny was cross-contaminating foods under the running water, a pan of frozen shrimp sitting on top of or even in a pair of frozen steaks. At one point, I didn't see this one. Johnny ran some frozen steaks under hot water to thaw them quickly because they needed to be cooked right then. This was a huge problem, and had I seen it, I'd have wanted to punch the fool in his face. We sometimes ran checks of multiple hours and had frequent guest complaints. One guest even threw his silverware at the host. Johnny was called up front and actually took the guest's side, leaving the host in tears. I believe he even comped the guy's meal. Johnny was a real class act. I made it my mission to do something about him. At the very least, he was going to get someone very ill from his shenanigans. So I sat down with a district manager who had brought Johnny in and spoke with him at length and great detail about how bad Johnny was, how terrible the morale was, and how he could get people ill, all of it. He asked me point blank what I thought of Johnny, and I told him, Johnny is an idiot. Nothing came of it. Christmas was coming, and I knew I was quitting in a couple of months. Johnny insisted on having a Christmas party at a bar a town away, but fraternizing between management and hourly employees was against company policy, so I didn't go. Johnny got quite drunk and drove himself home. I heard from coworkers that Johnny had been pulled over. Oops. A week or so later, I wrote a lengthy email detailing everything Johnny had messed up on, wrote about the Christmas party, and included screenshots of court records I was able to look up on the town's website. I set up a burner email account and messaged everyone I could find in the Emerald Wednesday hierarchy. When I went back to work a couple of days later, we had a shiny new general manager and no one knew what I had done. I am not proud of this, but he was making lives miserable. The restaurant was failing, and I was certain he was a public health risk. How do you thaw out frozen meat? Do you let it sit, or do you run it under cold water? Let me know in the comments. Next we've got, don't mess with a Navy vet. So, just a note, this isn't my story, it's my grandfather's. Some backstory, he's 79 and kicking, but isn't in the best shape anymore. He was drafted into the army while in high school and then enlisted in the navy afterwards. Before I was born, he was honorably discharged and until I was about two, he was getting a criminal justice degree and then went on to be the sheriff of the county he lives in. He retired probably four to six years ago. My grandma also worked in the army. She had a desk job, I don't know the specifics, and retired three years before my grandpa did. So they make a decent amount in pensions. Not a lot, but enough to pay taxes on the house that's been in my grandma's family for a few generations and enough to spoil us grandkids when we come visit, as grandparents do. It will be important to note, later in the story, that I have an uncle who lives in the same town as my grandpa and is currently a deputy for the police department. Anyways, on to the story. So maybe four years ago, I was just 14, my grandpa decided he wanted a shed. He's a big woodworking guy and makes benches and bookshelves and nightstands, etc., etc. in his free time. But he isn't in shape to build a structure even with the help of my cousins. So he decided to hire this guy who we'll call John. He liked hiring local and this guy was from the small town my grandpa was from and still lives in. When my grandpa hires John in the winter, he says he'll start construction at the beginning of spring. Where we live, this is usually when the weather allows as it snows well into spring for some years, and he'll have the construction done by the end of fall. He gives my grandpa a quote. I don't know the amount exactly. My grandpa is excited to have a little workshop of his own, and so is my grandma, because she doesn't like all the noise the saws and drills make when he works in the basement. Spring rolls around, and John doesn't show. My grandpa already had to pay a small portion up front, so he's a little upset, and calls John to ask where he is. John says he got another contracting project out of town and it will be a bit before he can get back to my grandfather's shed. He didn't come until October. Due to the weather in the state I live in, that meant construction really couldn't start. He got the foundation down and that was it. My grandpa is a little upset but understands. 
Hey, this local guy got a big gig, not a big deal. It takes this guy three years to finish the shed. So my grandpa is angry, understandably, but doesn't say anything to him. He pays John what John quoted him, plus additional costs because of the time it took. But he calls the company that gave John a contracting permit to file an official report against him. I don't know how this works, and I might be getting this part wrong. It goes without a hitch. He thinks it's over, right? Wrong. On my cousin's graduation that year, John, uninvited, shows up and tells my grandpa he still owes $6,000. My grandpa basically told him to come back on a different day because my cousin is more important. That night, he got an email from John's lawyer. It was something along the lines of, you still owe John and John's wife, let's call her Jill, $6,000 that hasn't been paid. My grandpa responds with, send me an invoice. He instantly got in touch with his lawyer. He doesn't get an electronic invoice, but two days later gets a letter on his doorstep with a note inside signed by Jill saying, you still owe $6,000, with the original quote attached, but the cost whited out, so there was an additional nearly $10,000 added. So he sends the original copy of the quote, along with a letter from Jill, as well as a printed copy of the email from John and Jill's lawyer to his lawyer, and talks to my uncle, who we'll call Dave. So Dave starts asking people offhand about John and starts bringing John up to his work friends, before finding out that a few years prior, John had been reported for theft, but the case hadn't went anywhere. Dave digs a little and finds more and more police reports saying that John has repeatedly stolen from people around the town, as well as failed to pay the people that he hires over the summer. The police department couldn't deal with this, so that's why no arrests had been made, as they're all matters that needed to be settled in court. Dave starts making a small file full of copies of the reports. Meanwhile, my grandpa's lawyer is trying to sort out the issue without my grandpa needing to go to court. My grandpa gets a discount that lowers the 6,000 still owed to about 4.5,000, but my grandpa is still livid. And after talking to Dave, he decides he's going to take it to court. My grandpa goes to court with his lawyer and has both the small packet from Dave as well as his own records. I wasn't there for the trial, so I can't say exactly what happened, but John had to pay out $10,000 plus some to my grandpa as well as numerous other fees to various other clients and employees, had to do community service work, I don't remember how much, and got his contracting license permanently revoked. Last I heard, John and Jill had moved out of the country and John was working as a cashier somewhere due to the fact that he couldn't become a contractor and hadn't gone to school for anything else. Since then, he's found some sketchy spots in the structure, but nothing major, so with the help of my oldest cousin, 19, they can actually fix the problems before they get bad. My grandpa loves his shed, by the way, and built me a bookshelf for my 17th birthday. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.